right. Uh, good morning, good morning, colleagues. Uh, this is it sounds so formal, but it's not not meant to be. Uh, but I don't know everybody here formally, and I think I think we are recording this. I think that comes as a surprise to all of you, except for myself, because uh, I arranged it. So uh, I thought it's best that we. So let me just give you the background, and then I'll go around and we introduce ourselves to the camera. Uh, what happened was that uh, Rabbi called me, and he says, "You know, this is." Why don't I apply for this grant? And really, I, I've got better things to do. I'm, I'm busy. And I sort of dilly dallied a bit. And then Brian convinced me. He says, why don't you just do this? And, you know, Brian's very convincing in his quiet way. So, <laughs> so I said, okay. And I applied for some funding. And the idea was to investigate e-learning at UKZN. And let me, uh, all of us have been involved in this in some way or the other for a long time. I mean, our, you know, Craig can... Brian, we know we've started investigating this in our department for a long time. But nothing seems to have taken hold. There's no traction. And, and I thought, how do we do this? The traditional way of doing it is do a survey, write a paper. But we've done this before. People have done this before, with multiple research articles, yet nothing's happening. So I thought the best way to do this, or the different, maybe not the best way, the different way to do it, is have focus group discussions with key people. And Kriyanka has been tasked with finding who the key people are. Uh, and uh, so, so this is the first focus group of academics. Uh, the idea is then to have a focus group of students, the ICS division, and if necessary, the academics back again. Right? So we've got funding for this, and uh, you know we provided tea and lunch. And the idea is to let's have a discussion and try and forget the cameras in there. I know it's hard, but we'll get used to it. And the idea is then uh, the idea behind the recording is that uh, just to just to have a record of it. I mean, just to keep it in our archives. We have the facilities. Why not use them? You know, and I've, I've all see, often seen Jasper advertising the facilities. And I've never had reason to come in and use it. But I thought this is an ideal opportunity to do this. So uh, so that, that that's what it is. And I think what we'll do is we'll start with Craig here to introduce yourselves, just so the camera gets it, and so we have it for the, for the record. Right. Um, Craig, uh, from the School of... What school am I from again? Management, <laughs> IT and governance. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's me. And so, uh, as Minaj said, my background is in uh, IT and then my further research and PhD was in education. So, obviously, I had a real passion for that sort of convergence of education and technology. So, anything that moves this agenda forward, I'm excited about. Okay, I'm Brian MacArthur. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> um, also from the same school as Craig, IT is my sort of discipline. Um, also, a PhD with a bit of a multidisciplinary look at education and, and IS uh, as, as a discipline. Um, at the moment, acting college dean for teaching and learning, so so really tasked with with moving this agenda along. Very excited to be here as well. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Bobby. I'm standing in for Professor Navin Chetty, who is the acting dean for teaching and learning for the College of CES. I've been an academic for ten years, and then I've moved on to academic development. I was in a committee uh, which is looking at e-learning policy for UKZN. So that hasn't moved much further, but we're still working on issues related to e-learning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Cecile from the Graduate School of Business and Leadership in the College of Law Management Science. Hi, I'm Heidi. I'm the academic leader for teaching and learning in the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics. My discipline is philosophy, but I'm very interested in, in education um, and I, I sh suppose I should put my cards on the table straight away that I'm highly suspicious of e-learning um, and yeah I think I'll stop there. The, the doors that <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, my name is Andy Lekati, uh, a lecturer in the College of Health Sciences more specifically in the School of Laboratory Medicine and Medical Sciences. Yes, that's what it's called. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm relatively new to this new teaching thing, but when I got employed, we started using this whole e-learning, and so I'm really quite interested and just happy to be here and share my experiences. Okay. Um, my name's Joseph Jerry. I am teaching in the Teaching and Learning Unit, specifically with the Foundation um, Foundation program. Um, have one leg also in the School of IAS, Formation Systems and Technology. That's where I come from. Um, my background, more of my PhD, is looks at uh, more of adoption 
of technology. So I think that's where the, 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 the passion comes from. It's more of adoption of technologies for development. So in this particular case, the focus, <coughs> I've been focusing a bit on, um, quite a bit on technologies for education. And um, quite recently in the uh, past two, three years, we've been working more with uh, blended approaches, how to adopt blended approaches and so on and so forth. So yes. Uh, I'm Krimin Pele. I'm from the Graduate School of Business and Leadership. I think I'm really here because I was the former Dean of Teaching and Learning at the College of Law and Management Studies. And with Joseph, um, in fact, um, uh, I was responsible for uh, appointing Joseph part-time <clears throat> as the college's e-learning person. And um, at the time, we were trying to get um, e-learning embedded into the access program. I think all we really were able to do was really just get our staff and students um, familiar with Moodle, which is not really e-learning per se, but, but that was a start. But as Manot said earlier, uh, it was difficult to get traction with some of the initiatives. Um, when I uh, came into the college as the uh, Dean of Teaching and Learning, the only thing we had in the college was the podcasting facility that Manoj had set up. And at the time, um, only one person who's no longer here uh, was using it. And I don't know if anyone is using it at the moment. Um, I just want to end by saying I've had some very good e-learning experiences, though, <clears throat> when I've joined uh, international colleagues in, in seminars and courses. Um, and, and so in other words, I was both a student and a participant um, in e-learning modalities and found them very useful. Uh, but of course, there are areas where e-learning um, is a drawback when you're performing illusions, for instance, but that's another topic. <laughs> okay, Thank you, Khalees. I, I think to kick off, the I was involved in a school review recently at the university uh, on an e-learning program. <clears throat> and what struck me was that there seems to be a uh, confusion, if you will, as to what e-learning is. So as, as Kirvin said, you know, he says uh, Moodle is not e-learning. Clearly it's not. And I think many of us around this table might have a, co a congruent sort of idea about that. But, but it's not necessarily the case throughout the university. So it seems to me that if people think we can put things on Moodle and everybody has access to it now, that's e-learning and we've done it. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, when we really investigated this matter, and we looked at many of us sort of use Moodle or Moodle equivalent, but we also have a classroom to which we go. Now, if you take away that classroom part of it, that is our lecture, and you have the Moodle, does that become e-learning? You know, and uh, and so so I want to discuss that, and so and one of the also the issues that came up from the ICS guys, they said, but we've got no direction. Uh, Bob, you mentioned about the e-learning policy. Uh, uh, there's a group or something. But their, their point was, we have no direction, there's no policy, so we don't know what to do. There's nothing driving the e-learning agenda at, at UKZN, except in fits and starts by individuals. Can we mentioned the podcasting in our school? We did. We set up this whole thing in 2010. It was a big opening ceremony, etc. It was used for a bit, but it's not used anymore. Oh, well, technology has moved on. But you'd expect that if it was being used by people then, they would have moved into the new yeah. space. But sort of nothing's happened. And it seems to be driven in fits and starts and in little pockets by individuals rather than a university-wide approach. And I thought if we can discuss that here, and one of the things, you know, the question I want to put to you guys is, if you had carte blanche, if there were no restrictions, uh, and, and, and this committee, for example, let's call ourselves a committee, could recommend to the university what we do in terms of e-learning. What would we do? And I think I want you to also think about that, think about that in relation, not just teaching and learning, because e-learning is a coordinated, it's a, it's a holistic platform that supports teaching and learning. Craig and I were just talking before we started about all these horrible forms that we have to fill in. I mean, right now we're going through the process in our school, so you guys are going through it as well, about aligning the new template to the old template. But if you had a proper database, that would be automatic. 
uh, if, if the IT was properly supporting learning, then we wouldn't have to fill in forms at each step of the way. But many of us do it blindly uh, because we don't know that it could be done differently. And so perhaps, you know, let me just throw that open and let's see what's your views of it. Okay, shall I kick off? Yep. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my sense of, of e-learning is, is very broad and not very tied to any particular author. So essentially, my, my sense of e-learning is that it's, it's any form of learning that is enabled, uh, facilitated, deepened by technology. So that's kind of an obvious thing in a sense. I would, I would keep the administrative side um, separate, although necessarily must be there, but I would try to focus on, or keep the focus on, um, and I love the focus on learning rather than teaching. Of course, the teacher is a critical part of the, of the exercise, but the focus is on, so what makes learning better mm. using technology? To be simplistic, perhaps it's a kickoff. Kick I'll, I'll just pick up on that. Um, I, I think the, the one thing Brian said is, very, is important. No, both things. Everything you said is important, not just the one thing. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, the one is, and Brian talked about this um, focusing on, on the learning side. What tends to happen, in my view, is there is a, a conflation of goals here, and people get confused about what e learning is. And it comes from, especially for us who have come from a field of IT in our background, it comes from when we put technology into a business. The reason we put technology into a business, primarily, simply put, is to make them more efficient, because that's how you make money. When we come to a university, you ask the same question, why do you put technology into a university? It's not efficiency, it's effectiveness. Now, we can confuse those two. So we can put in a system, we can get our forms more effective, mm. we can upload our marks faster, mm. and now we think we're doing e-learning. Mm. No, we're not, you've just got, and that's why they call it a learning management system. We focus so much on the management. So you have gotta be very careful that when we put whatever this is in, it's actually not about efficiencies, although we want that. It's about does this make our learning more effective? Yeah. And coming back to you, RCS often says, we don't know what to do. Understandably, what is RCS about? RCS is about efficiencies. They are a RT arm. So when they come to give us e-learning, what are they going to do? They're going to give you tools to make you teach faster and quicker. So, and I spoke to them the other day, and they say, well, no one, no lecturers, no academics, no education people are telling us what to do because that's their job so if you come and say from an education perspective please provide this then they could make us more effective and i think this is where some of the problem comes so as academics we step back and say it come in that's great for a business but not great for education and i think that really is an important thing that we don't confuse those two goals of efficiency and effectiveness yeah just to pick up on that i think talking about the environment that we're in is really important and and i don't know that well, there are two things. One is that is our environment conducive to e-learning? And I don't need to explain why in some cases it isn't, but it could be. Um, but the other is, and I think both of you touched on it, is that for many of us, it's come as e-learning is a replacement of traditional mm -hmm. methods. And that doesn't take consideration of the environment where people learn differently in different ways. And you use the word complementary or make it better. And it is about that. And, and this kind of put your courses on Moodle and then we don't give you printed material because we've replaced mm -hmm. material is hugely problematic. And, and I was at a, a, a workshop the other day and someone pointed out, and it's such a great term, that this Moodle system has created a culture of laziness among staff mm -hmm. and I, I said well what do you mean You're constantly having to update Moodle and everything and he said no but you do it week by week he said in the old days you had your whole course planned at the beginning of the semester because you had your reader and you had your test and you had everything else now because it's all instant and we can upload a reading this week and we can upload a reading next week there isn't that kind of forward planning and and I thought well that's exactly what's happening and it feels like we're on this kind of <laughs> Treadmill, yeah. yeah, a very, very fast treadmill. <laughs> and so for me, e-learning's got to complement rather than replace. And I think that's where we've kind of got ourselves on this wheel where we, we, we think if we replace, job done. And it, I, I know I went to Craig's talk and it's got to be different from traditional learning. It's not just an electronic form of traditional learning. And I think that's where we stuck. 
Yeah. If, I, if I can continue to what Haley says, <coughs> it's also a difference in perception between the staff and the students. You know, we have a generation gap. All the staff, uh, most of them, obviously, are from an older generation who have not, not been exposed to IT so much uh, effectively. And then we have this huge generation of new students um, who are from this era and who like to use technology. But to me, it looks like, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from experience in my school that, you know, there were um, instances last year where students had completely stopped coming to lectures. And the reason for that was they say that if the things that the lecturer takes in class is already on Moodle, mm -hmm. and what the lecturer does is just come and read from the slides sure. that's already on Moodle, there's no reason to be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And to an extent that we had to approach the dean, and for three modules at level two, we had to take the stuff out of Moodle with his permission <laughs> so that we could enforce the student coming for lectures. And then there was a whole petition that came to us saying that, you know, no, it's a, it's a teaching and learning policy that stuff should be on Moodle. And to the dean, again, goes back to the dean saying, you know, please enforce the lecturer to put stuff on the Moodle. So it's a practical thing as well where the lecturer believes that he's still good to do his job. But Moodle is kind of replacing the whole thing whereby the students are feeling that, you know, they don't want to be in the lectures anymore. Isn't that the fundamental uh, issue then of teaching and providing with, providing information? Uh, if you're teaching and, and your teaching is simply to reiterate what you provided in Moodle, mm -hmm. then are you really <coughs> teaching? Uh, I, and I made this comment at a talk I gave recently and uh, probably didn't go down too well. But in any event, you know, and I'm going to put it out here. I, I, you know, I think What's happening, and to take your point, Adi, and, and what Bobby was this, we, we, it, it certainly at the, at, the, at, the, at the junior undergraduate level, lots of what we do is being driven by the textbook vendors. They'll come to you, they'll say, I'll create for you, Kirvin, a, a specialized textbook. You want chapter one from here, chapter two from there, chapter three. No problem, put it all together. Mm. They'll bind it for you, they'll, they'll put a nice logo on it, and you sell it. And then they'll give you all the slides, slides yeah. they'll give you all the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. They'll give you the talking points. So what do what do lazy lecturers do? And there are many of them amongst us. I mean, we just have to be you know, plunge this right, which is probably why I didn't go too well. But the, but the point is, what do we do? We put these slides. We put the same slides that we got from the. So there's really no work that I have to do, right? Uh, uh, we put the same slides onto Moodle, and the end of the year, it's MCQs largely first year. I have no problem with the MCQs except if they're badly done, and then the MCQs are taken from that same group uh, of stuff and given to the students and the students see no value in this uh, okay. well well students will take the easiest way we're always students we know this yeah we'll take the easiest way out yeah. okay and and they take the easiest way out so i think the point brian made is about this learning thing yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. is re learning really taking place if you put stuff on moodle and tell the students go and read this and then i'll examine you on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have we? Uh, yeah i just want to say that um we're touching on a number of different points sure. here. Um, at the one level, I agree with with Heidi about um, there are contexts in which, where I teach, you cannot replace the creation of that learning environment, the field in which everyone is participating, um, and with, with e-learning. Okay, and I won't go into the dynamics of that, but there is a certain field that grows, like here now, there is something that's dialogic, that's occurring. Yeah. Yet this may still benefit a, a viewer, mm -hmm. and they may tap into um, the dialogic dynamics that, that's starting to emerge here, and say, oh, this was very interesting. And so there is um, almost um, a subliminal aspect to what's happening here. But if we simply did something by, by way of an e-learning platform, you put something on, on a platform and we all had to respond and type in our responses, you'd get a different kind of, of dynamic. Okay. Um, so uh, so in, in that respect, I see the value of that kind of, the, that kind of dialogic learning context. But it appears to me that that, that works very often in the small groups up to, in, in my case, I, 20, 30, 40, and then after that it starts to break down. 
I'm seriously questioning the need for our large lecture learning environments. Cape Town UCT, where my son is, um, virtually tapes every class. Interestingly enough, he wants to be in class. I think he's just OCD, you know, I've got to be in the class. But at the same time, he knows that there's a backup if he's not well or he wants to revise. But he says more than 60% don't pitch up at all because they know this is being filmed. And you're right, what is the value from a learning point of view if all that is being done is a regurgitation of material that you can pick up on your uh, learning management system, right? So, but I think we as educators are somewhat confused. By for this. <laughs> and, and, and we don't know actually where learning takes place. Some of it know it through intuition, and some of it is, I think, our own arrogance that we think uh, I've been teaching this large class yes. in this way for you know for twenty years, mm -hmm. and therefore it must continue to happen. Now, why do we need to force students to come? Yeah. If there's no benefit for them in terms of learning, yeah. mm. the question though is, the question is yes. I mean, you, you, and, I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't say unless we can actually justify mm. that within that space there's something that mm. happens which is beyond that, is that information. Yes, yes, absolutely. So something mm. must happen in the classroom that is beyond the information that is stored on Moodle. Yeah. yeah, and this dialogic stuff and the interaction yeah. with the class yeah. that can't be stored on Moodle. It still should be recorded. Yes. But then that's when students might feel the need to turn up because then their contribution to the class is also recorded and, and, and you're building on the knowledge uh, rather than just repeating. Mm -hmm. So if you're just repeating stuff that's on Moodle, are you creating any knowledge? Yep. Last thing, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd just like to add in, so from the perspective of the students that we teach in the business school, um, quite often it's more mature students who are working, they have busy lives. So quite often we've had a situation where we would place things on Moodle and the students would tell us they don't have the time to do that. They want to come to class and they want a set of notes and they actually want to be taught in, in inverted commas. And they've actually made it very clear that for them learning is also about learning from the classmates mm -hmm. who are also working students. So to engage discussions and to also, if they're confused, ask the lecturer in person. So I think that's what we found from our perspective. Um, I've been listening to a lot of the comments and I think the starting point for me always is that there has to be an appreciation of the fact that um, what we what's currently happening is it's bigger than the way I think we're approaching it right now. And when I say that, what I mean is it should be looked at more of a, a global perspective from a global perspective, and this applies from the concept of disruption. Now, the world is being disrupted. And for a long time, it's being disrupted by technology. And for a long time, this has happened in so many other sectors. Now, the disruption is coming into academia. And I think this is where the confusion is really coming in. Now, disruption in academia has been brought in by the internet. And this is the concept of e-learning. Now, where we are, we're in a traditional university. And traditional universities mean going into class and delivering a course. So, the confusion is now coming in when you say e-learning, which essentially came in, when you look at disruption, it comes in from the um, non-adopters, non the people that don't have access to traditional universities. What do they do? They learn the courses online. So when you say e-learning in a traditional university, it brings a confusion in that academics are now thinking what? So, okay, everything is going online. I'm being pushed out of the equation. Yeah. And first resistance comes in from there. Academics are now thinking, uh, I'm not comfortable with this. I put everything on Moodle. Where does that put me? But it actually, in academic, I mean, traditional institutes like us, I think the concept should not be about e-learning, but it should actually shift to blended learning, yes. which is the idea of using these e-learning technologies, but in a blended format. So you still have the lectures, then you have your e-learning, uh, your e-learning e platforms. And what are you doing with Moodle? With Moodle, what you're doing is essentially the, the, the content that you should read, which is course material and everything, put it up on Moodle. 
Now, your lectures are not a repeat of the content that you have, but rather is, is the interaction. That's where the, mm -hmm. I want to learn from my peers. And that's where you as an academic, you shift, your space now shifts. And I think that should be, it should be made clear to academics that you're not being made useless, but rather your role shifts to more of a facilitator. So you're joining your information that you're putting up there and you're facilitating conversations within and exercise and so on and so forth. And that creates a safe space for the academic and the student and you meet at a neutral point. So I think the concept should not be about necessarily <coughs> e-learning, but it should be about blended learning in traditional institutes. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add on to what Heidi spoke about when she said it should this e-learning should rather complement rather than replace. Um, and also about this generational gap thing that Bobby mentioned. Um, I teach at the medical school and we most of our lectures there are recorded. So I've got lectures from dating back from 2015, I think, that have been recorded and are still up. So every, and every year they record. But I, I find that attendance never drops. So I asked some of the guys, um, why, why do you guys continue attending um, when the lectures are up there? And to my, what they usually respond to is that they want to be able to ask questions. They, they, they need that interaction with the lecturer because as you're teaching with some of the stuff, you, you, you use application scenarios and they'll want to engage and they'll want to ask what if such and such, which is something that they don't have. And these are guys that are really young. They go on YouTube and watch these lectures. They, they, they interact on, on, on all these things, but they still want that interaction with the with the lecturers and the, and the classmates so it really is more about using e-learning as a, something to supplement which is a blend yeah so yes, so it's so blended learning so i really agree with yeah. the points that are being raised you've got a new gentleman sorry i don't know your name i'm sandy lembogas from i couldn't find one man that's fine <laughs> <laughs> it's from, from which school i'm from the school of field environment and development studies um, Thank you very much for joining us. I, you just have to blend in. <laughs> it's a blended process. Blended blend. yes. so blend blend. Yeah, I was going to pick up yeah. on a couple of things, and I think, uh, you know, talking about um, this whole concept, it's actually a blended learning is very important. But also what Kribben was saying, I think what's happened is a lot of lecturers have been here for a, a long time. We've got two things that are happening. So we've got a traditional institution, yes. and what do we do? We lecture. Okay. And as lecturers, we are custodians of knowledge. Or that's what we have been. But what's happened over the last X 10 years or whatever, knowledge has become ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. You just Google it, it's out there. Yeah. So that has a huge impact on our role because if you wanted knowledge in the old days, you would knock on my door and I would reveal it to you or you'd come to my lecture and I'd reveal it to you. It doesn't work like that. So now what happens when we try and make this change, I take my knowledge and it's all beautifully stuck in, you know, I can get the textbooks and I put it up there and now I sort of think, well, I've, I've, I've done, done my thing, thing. Yeah. you know, now my knowledge is up there, which, yeah, it is. But what hasn't happened is we have to move from these custodians of knowledge to leaders of learning. Mm -hmm. And it's a totally different thing. And the, the, where this starts to fall apart is as academics, we've never been trained yes. in teaching and learning. We are content specialists. We, are, we know nothing about pedagogy. We know nothing about education because that worked for a long time because we came here as the content specialist. But now in my content given to you all of a sudden I have a really difficult role because I actually don't know how to lead learning I've never had to do that and so that's part of the challenge that you now face you say well you know if you hand your content across the Moodle your role is actually changing so you talk about these amazing things they come into your lecture for a conversation wow we didn't have conversations I just spoke and you listened what are we going to do now and so that's a totally different dynamic and I think that's where the challenge and it's a it's a paradigm shift which is huge as you say, this is an institution that has done something for a long time, and e-learning and even blended learning is creating major disruptions. But isn't to that uh, Tubin touched on the point? Our first year classes are five hundred and six hundred. Mm, exactly. Mm. You're not really going to facilitate that conversation. Should we not replace first year classes with tutorial groups, multiple tutorial sessions with our content online? I'm just putting it out there. Mm. I mean, so that will then that that will then create this environment for discussion. You know. Amongst. So also the point, uh, perhaps another seed point is, in my discussions, not only at our university, but other universities locally and internationally, is that often people think of e-learning as an, as an easy 
uh, as an easy alternative. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I often think if that's the case, then you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Because a proper oh, e-learning, proper e-learning yeah. is just pressure. as hard, that's if not really harder, hard. then I'd much rather come in front of a class and, and teach <laughs> uh, or talk to the class about uh, than, than having to. And, and also the other question is, do, if, if you're, uh, uh, Bob, we spoke about the generational gap, we mentioned this in there. Some of us are slightly older than others over here. The, the, the point is though, do, you, do, do we need to know technology to be able to use e-learning? Uh, is, is that a barrier? I mean, do we have to all understand how databases work or, 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 or the back end works, etc.? Or do we need to have support that we need to conceptualize the e-learning and, and, and leave the technology to somebody else? Because it seems to me that often the, the issue we face in discussions is lecturers saying, oh, but you know, to upload to Moodle is a problem and then Turnitin is a problem and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, and it becomes burdensome uh, rather than facilitating. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Katie. Yeah. No, I just wanted to, to follow up on what Craig said, is that, and I suppose a little bit of what you were talking about, is that, and maybe it's because I come from philosophy where we we really want to generate knowledge rather than impart knowledge. Uh, most of us use the Socratic method where it's just, why do you think that? Why do you think that? Why do you think that? So in, as a 10 years of lecturing, I, I would hate to think that any of my lectures had been a one-way traffic. And... Um, and my concern with with the way things are being done now is that our students, a lot of our students are coming from schools where it's one way traffic. Mm. And I want my first years, and yes, there are 350 or 400 of them, mm. I want them to critically engage. And when we go and dump stuff on Moodle, they're sitting in their phone, it's passive, mm. that's exactly mm. the word, it's mm. passive. Well, I don't know if passing, passive and learning even go together. I just think <laughs> it's passive, it's just passive and there's no learning. No learning. <laughs> and so for me, it's much more about get, getting that critical engagement, getting that noise, the mm -hmm. disruption mm -hmm. you're talking about. And, and I worry that the way we're doing it now is that we're just we're just repeating yeah. the same mistake. Sure. And, and, and I quite like the idea of not preparing for a lecture i'm mm. going to admit it and going in there and <laughs> saying so what, so what do you think mm. and just having people mm. think yeah. at me yeah. which is what i think at any university in any discipline that's what we want because mm. knowledge is anyone can have knowledge yeah. you don't have to come to ukzn to get knowledge you just have to have an internet connection mm. but to think critically you need people and right. and that's where i would hate to get rid of that first year experience because they haven't been taught to think critically at school. So that yeah. first year experience is where we've got to get them thinking critically. Because if we start get, getting them to think critically at honors level, we're in serious trouble. Aren't, we, yeah. aren't we being idealistic? Uh, because we are faced with serious issues. I mean, we talk about capacity issues. Oh. Uh, the research has shown that to be able to do the traditional stuff that all, all of us like, oh. Uh, we'll have to build 30,000 classrooms or lecture rooms in the next five years to cater for the intake. I mean, just, just, in, just in Africa uh, and, and not of the world. So, so is there, aren't there these pressures on trying to, to, to create a massification, if you will? Mm -hmm. And is, is, but, but, but is what we're doing uh, uh, proper massification? In other words, so, so we've got to separate two things over here. One is internally to our university, as Joseph says, the blended approach, how we deal with our students, which is 45,000 students. If the university wishes to reach 145,000 students, then we need to break the mold and do something different. But if you're going to stay as UK is over 45,000 students, and we need to enhance the learning experience, then uh, what Joseph says about the blended approach and curriculum, et cetera, we need, to, we need to explore this. But if you want to solve the country's problems about higher education, together with other universities, then we have to go some other route. I don't think we're discussing that second approach. We're not solving the world's problems. We're dealing with UK's area, okay? So I think, I think the point made is we need to look within the constraints. We need to constrain our discussion and say, how do we enhance the, the experience for our students in UK's area, making the role of the lecturer more, well, Let's, let's put it, re, reasserting yeah. the primary role of the lecturer. But I think what you're saying, yeah. there are definitely two big forces at play here. Yeah. We've got the, the demands of the public, of government, of, for massification, and then we've got the ideals. And I was about to comment on your thing. The original university was what you were talking about, the Socratic, the dialogue, and that is the beautiful, pure form. And I see what's going to happen is we're going to have a 
split eventually. There's training and there's education. Yes. Massification is train, get them to understand coding, get them to understand <coughs> whatever, and that's going to be online and have it. That's not, but we as a university sit almost being pulled in both directions, bring in more, bring in more. But as academics, we're saying we want to prepare you for a life that where you're a lifelong learner, where you're a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. That's the real role of a university research education. And we're feeling the, the pull because on the one side, we need to drop the fees, we need to get more in. The other side, we want to prepare you for this other incredible 21st century life. And I think we're going to face that here. So, And I think understanding the, the terms of reference, are we putting this in? to get more people through quicker, which comes to what I said earlier, efficiency, mm. or are we putting this in to teach people better and more effectively? And they're totally divergent. Mm. And until we actually know what that is, yeah. we're going to be sitting in this limbo, some doing this and others saying, well, I can do an MCQ on Moodle and look how many I can get them all through. And, and you go, know, wow, you've tech, you've done it. And others are looking, but that's not what I wanted to do. But so let's take a little skip. Um, I don't know where to get in, but I want yeah. to re respond first from your question. Um, you you were asking whether do you need to know technology to be able to to make use. I think it's a yes and no in a way. Um, I think the basics it's important. Um, I was I'm, I'm I'm thinking about an experience I had when I was teaching a module called issues in community development. Now, when we when I was using a forum facility within Moodle, way they are able to just send their question, and all other peers are interacting, and then we ask questions. I also come in as the teacher to clarify certain things. So it was quite exciting, you know. In fact, it was even to a point of frustration. It was at twelve midnight. I had to receive some of the <laughs> notification. <laughs> but I think it depends on what the content is and what is the subject matter. If it's topical, you might get them at it, mm -hmm. despite what time of the day it is. And of course, the issue of typing in, uh, unless you allow the the Facebook language of the. The, the, the shorthand, then at least you get more interaction. But if you want, if you are like other colleagues who want their <laughs> yes. ne neatly crafted yeah. sentences, then you are you're gonna get them, you know, shying away from the conversation because you know the grammar issues is going to be an issue. But if it's just going to be the so the basics in terms of at least know how to type something because then you unless there is something I don't know whether there is a voice recording facility there where you just speak into it, I haven't seen it, um, unless it's that, so it, they just talk. But when they come to class, uh, just for interaction, they can actually get that from Moodle mm -hmm. via the, the, the forums and everything. They are able, in fact, it's even more flexible. They can do it any other time, not confined to that lecture time. Mm -hmm. So the basics is important to know. And, and the other experience I have is with the colleagues. When I joined in in 2014, uh, nobody in my discipline was wanting to say anything about what. So I was new, I wanted to understand it, and I had to go to the older folks, and then nobody wanted to educate with me. I had to learn, I had to get into ICS helping me, and when I got to the end of it, then they came to my door to say, please help us with this and this and this and this and this. And turn it in. I have to go on creating all the accounts now for all the modules. And, 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 and. But it, it, I think it, it, there's still that sense of, you know, we don't want, it's like a hot potato when it comes to technology. And yet it's very important, I think. There are programs that are run entirely on Moodle. For example, there's a program that we're running with different countries. It has to be on Moodle because we are sitting in different countries and it's it's important that we use that platform maximally. You know? So I, some basics are important in that sense. Yes, um, just on the technology thing that, we, that, that, that keeps popping up, and you asked the question that do we need to understand the technology. I think another relevant question is do the students need to understand the technology? Because we're dealing, I'm going to speak specifically about UKZN now, mm -hmm. because we're bringing it home. We're dealing with some students that come here and some of them don't even know how to operate a computer. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're coming in at first year and we're asking them to join Modo and post stuff on Turnitin and, mm -hmm. you know, go online to watch videos. So it, it, it poses quite a stumbling block to a lot of the students. So we assume that because they're young, they're familiar with the, with the technology, which isn't necessarily quite true for all the cases. Mm -hmm. 
So another thing that we must, when we looking at this whole e-learning thing is, is it suitable for all the students? Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to maximize the learning process or enhance the learning process rather. So we need to try and find out whether what we're doing, is it going to be beneficial for the student that comes from the rural area? Sorry, one second. Pass has just joined us. Pass, just introduce yourself for the camera. I'm lecturer in the School of Information, so a School of Management, Writing, Governance, and the Discipline of ISNT. Pass and second. Pass and second, yeah. Yes, never. And I think just to add on to, to what Andrew is saying is the issue of full time versus part time students. So, mm. will this work if the student is not on campus all the time? Um, do, do they have a good internet connection? Do they have time to? To go and sit on Google and engage in discussions. But if they're part time, then yeah, I, 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 that, that's a valid question. I think we need to just focus a little bit here now. So, what exactly is our discussion about? <clears throat> is our discussion about so so the idea is here for us at the end of the session to come up with some key recommendations, if you will, uh, which I'll sort of formulate about e-learning at UKZ, given the current UKZ. We don't know what the future UKZ is going to be. Uh, at the moment, we have enrollment planning, and enrollment planning is pretty clear. We've got 45, I think it's 42,000 students, and we're not going to get much more. Okay, that, that's our limit, and this is what we realize to. So, uh, and, 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 and we are constrained in terms of our online learning platform, online learning, for example, by the HEQC, which says you only allow so many distant students in, in that format, and you only allow so many online courses, which is a bit strange. But I found all that out last week in this in this uh, review I was doing. So, so, so there's that side of it. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is this. Given the current environment we have with the, with the, yes, there are pressures of us, but the pressures are constrained in terms of those numbers. Uh, you know, uh, the university policy was supposed to be in the merger, no class larger than 250 students. You'll remember this, right? Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be 250 maximum class size in first year. Everybody's forgotten about that, and you know who, who has a unless you got one of the any of the big disciplines. What you teaching? Four hundred students, five hundred students. Five hundred and maybe five hundred. Five hundred, yeah. So, so you know that 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 sort of policy has gone out the door. The question is, how do we enhance the experience of students given technology? Now, we we mentioned Moodle, but there are other technologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, just this WhatsApp. There's YouTube. Uh, there's Facebook. There's Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of these things. Now, what is our experience of this, and, and how you know do, do we around this table, but generally in at the university, can we incorporate all of these technologies into enhancing the learning experience? And I, I think the point made by Brett, uh, Craig, sorry, right at the beginning, is that uh, about the effectiveness of using technology to make our teaching and learning more effective, and uh, and there's no reason for massification. At UKZN, as such, okay, but it's there's a, there's the reason there's the need for effectiveness in our teaching. Sanita, you you first, yeah. Um, I I I find it fascinating to use WhatsApp group for my supervision purposes. Um, my honor students are sitting in one group, my masters would sit in another, and then my PhD will sit in another. It's very easy because I say one thing. And then we interact like that. Of course, they still one on one, face to face, was still important. But most of the general stuff and uh, what is common in their studies is done via these groups, and it helps for those who are sitting in Zambia and other countries. So I think incorporating other platforms, it works for me. I'm not sure about other colleagues. Yeah, I would. I mean, in terms of what we get out of this, I mean, I think that. If we had a real focus that said e-learning, whatever, whatever that means, um, or whatever form it takes, two things: one, it's not a replacement, mm. because I think that uh, that's yeah, the anxiety yes. that yes. people have thought exactly. it's yes. a replacement. Yeah. And I think the other thing is to take really seriously that different modes of e-learning are effective for different things. And there yeah. is, I really don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. There is so much research that people who read online don't absorb don't have deep learning, don't absorb as much. You can't make notes on, you know, you can't page back and you can't do, I mean, there's, there's tons of stuff in the best universities with the best connections, with the best iPads and the best 
uh, laptops. You know, when I see students trying to read a 30 page article on their phones, I want to cry. Yes. Um, but using their phones for WhatsApp or using their phones to have a, a kind of poll in class or using their phones for that, I think that's brilliant and we, and we should definitely be harnessing that. But we've got to just figure out that certain and Moodle, I mean, I think Moodle forums are brilliant. It creates active learning, it creates involvement. Dumping readings on Moodle, very bad idea. Doesn't yeah. help anyone do anything. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did an experiment with my students. I had two classes, both third years. One was a class of um, 12 at St. Joseph's and, the se and one was a class of 55. St. Joseph's students got a reader. A, a, a piece of paper, a thing with paper. They all freaked because it was this thick. Mm. So class of 55, everything was on Moodle. All the readings were on Moodle. Students thought the course was great because they only got one little reading a week, but when they, you know, no one pointed it out. Pass rate, class of 12, 100%. Class rate, class of 55, 40%. When I did a survey afterwards, how many of you did the readings? Everyone in the class of 12 did the readings. The, the others they said no we come to lectures we don't need to do the readings and so so that was a huge I thought okay to put the readings on Moodle they'll do the readings in their spare time and then we'll discuss them in class what happened we came to class they hadn't done the readings, so I taught them the readings and so we've just got to figure out and and I think it does take work yeah. to figure out what works with what and what doesn't work with what and then and and then we'll have a policy that it's not about dumping lecture you know readings on moodle mm. <coughs> so that's what i would like to get out of this to know what works with what and what mm -hmm. what we shouldn't be doing uh, yeah um i'm just trying to have a sense of what's going around here and and i think there are a number of issues <coughs> and and i think um I'm also going to make a, a, a challenging comment that we, this is also what can happen with the academic environment, that we start touching upon areas that we can't solve now. Sure. And then as a result, the policies and what have you yeah. get no gain, gain no traction. So I'm sensing that we also don't really know ourselves mm -hmm. um, what is the nature of the learning environment that um, that we are supposed to be um, nurturing the actual nature of it, and actually what are the what works and what doesn't work. So to contradict Heidi, I'm a writer and I produce books, and I'm probably one of the oldest around the table here, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I've come from a tradition of having a book in my hand. And yet I've switched completely. I read my books off an iPhone, right? So I'm saying I read my books off an iPhone or an iPad. I'm not interested in ever buying a book unless it's some commemorative, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing that, then the argument that not everybody wants to read from may have to do with something else, mm -hmm. not necessarily the technology. Mm -hmm. I do agree for some people it might be difficult. Um, I do Bates eye exercises, and that perfectly works for me to continue reading for the next 10 years with just the minimum. <laughs> I'm being facetious, uh, uh, spectacles. <laughs> so, 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 and then Craig touched upon something like, and Joseph, and basically we all did, which we mustn't lose sight of. How do we make our learning effective? Uh, and we talked about an approach which may be the blended learning approach. Now, it strikes me that most of our academics don't even know about that. Yeah. Uh, Joseph and I tried to get a free course online. And we, yes, yes, we, yes. Had a, we had the money, but we didn't get have for our college. Was it the college yeah. or the university? It was the college. No, no, it was, no, no, it was for the university. It was, for the university. <coughs> it was about teaching everyone blended learning, yes. which we could still probably do. Um, now, so we mustn't lose sight of that because my daughter's just gone to Edinburgh. She's doing a master's there. It's um, a contact residential program, but they have a strong online component, mm -hmm. which they, uh, you, and you can't miss both. <laughs> mm -hmm. Both, both mm -hmm. are, so it's blended in, the, in that sense, right? And I'm sure within the contact lectures, uh, contact tutorials and face-to-faces, 
um, engagement, there is also a blended, a blended component. Your ubiquitous PowerPoint, your videos, and all of those things. So, um, so I'm not being dismissive when an academic says, but we want to teach critical thinking. I do. That's the bane of our existence at the moment, that so few of our stu students, even at postgraduate level, cannot think critically, right? And we see the, the, the advantage of having that face-to-face -face interaction. But I think very often an academic may say that and then says, and then almost dismiss that this other component is not necessary, which is the e-learning. Because in 10 years' time, the people that have been brought up on this are going to be the new lecturers at, at universities. And they're going to say, but this didn't work for me. And I want to use, I want to use technology. Uh, my biggest uh, lament possibly now is that our future teachers of schools are still being taught by old generation lecturers, right? Uh, so there's, there's going to be more disruption than we, than we care to, to imagine. I think also we need to focus on how effective what we do is going to be. Because we must also touch upon, uh, Manoj, the madness of higher education, mm -hmm. the massification, which simply says we now need 30,000 new lecture theatres. When uh, tiered lecture venues really don't work for us, you know. So we can contribute, but we've got to be able to contribute in a way that says, this is what works, this is what we now can get rid of, because it's clearly not working, it's already the, the context has been disrupted. Um, so going back to you, what you said, I think we need to hold, the, uh, as academics, where there's a certain... Uh, deep engagement that we want, that we probably had in, in our, uh, our education, which we see missing here. But in wanting that, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and dismiss e-learning and, and, or blended learning or whatever form of learning um, technology provides. Um, we don't throw that out. Because I think that's what I encountered now that I'm beginning to sense is what happened in the college that we couldn't get traction, is that people just um, didn't reflect deeply enough as to why they were not t adopting technology. Do you think, though, that because the university doesn't have a policy that's driving mm -hmm. this, this, this paradigm, that if it's left to individuals, they'll either take it or leave it? So, so you know, if, if I or myself or anybody around this table wants to do a blended learning approach, as, as, you, as your experience in DDS is when you, when you join the department, then you go and do it. Uh, but there's no policy type. If there's a policy, for example, this popular learning that we had to do, all of us, oh, yeah, no. there was a policy driving mm -hmm. it. We had to go online. We had to go and learn it. We have to tick those boxes. Mm -hmm. And we got reminders every week. Okay. Uh, so your blended learning course, for example, if it was a policy of the university, everybody had to go through to understand it. And, and you design the course, you put it online. And everybody had to go and read those uh, lecture slides. It's not really e-learning, but at least you had some exposure to it, mm -hmm. and then answer those questions. We might get somewhere in, in driving. Um, so I, I uh, disagree, and I don't know if you've, uh, um, you probably have. I think is it Peter Sinek or not? Uh, he he does those three circles, the magic circles. I've never seen. He and he looks at what makes companies like Apple so different from all the others. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can't remember his name or fan. And he basically says, if you look at technology companies, they all have a product, they all have a what they offer, right. you know, and they all have this, how they're going to get it to you. He says, but what makes the, why do you have Apple fanboys who are just like committed? End of the day, oh, it's a quality product, but I mean, so the Samsung, mm. and he says, because they're driven by this inner thing, the why. Right. And their thing is, you know, being different. That's their thing. And so when you pick up your Apple, you just like feel like <laughs> we're different, you know, and they've been very powerful at that. And so everyone else now appears like a copycat, you know, so when they go on the stage, like the old Steve Jobs and, you know, in the casual shirt, you just say, just do like, you know, like Apple, you know, they do the think differently thing. And so it, what my point is, if we want this to happen, 
staff have to understand why mm-hmm. they want to do this. Because if they don't have that, if that's yeah. not in their heart, because the why is your heart. Yeah. When so, for all of us sitting around, the reason I do all this e-learning, blended learning stuff, is I love it. Mm-hmm. I just love the, the, the joy on the, on the students' faces. It ignites me. My why is very obvious. If you come to the staff and you say, you will do this. Yeah. You will do this course. Just, what do they do like with Moodle? Mm. Well, just, my daughter says, you tell yes. them to use it. Some of the lecturers take a photograph of the, of <laughs> the black, of this blackboard yeah. and load it to Moodle. Yeah. Done Moodle. Yes, exactly. And yeah. so it just that's doesn't... That's not but if we can get them to see, and that, that's not an easy thing, no, it's but if you can get them to see and buy into the why, that this is going to change teaching and learning, it's going to make your job so exciting, given the side there are those lazy people who are never sure. going to get there. You know, that I believe could be transformational. Mm. And then you've got, okay, now I know why I want to do it. Okay, tell me how. What are the opportunities? All right, guys, let's, we have been instructed to take a break at quarter two to have your tea. So let's do that and let's pick up with Joseph when we come back. And I think that's an interesting point. Of course, I agree with you. Why is important. I mean, sometimes though, I think you have to push the why. Through some kind yeah, so maybe of what we've got to do yeah. is almost force them to attend something that will explain to them the why. Now, I've been running a lot of these yeah, things yeah, with yeah. the staff. And essentially, yes. my whole goal of that was really to tell them the why. <laughs> and out of that, if 50 come and 20 have got the why, right, so those are the ones who want to go through to say, show me how now. You know, and that's great. Okay, let's take okay. a break. Okay, let's go and have some tea and coffee and things. And come Thank you. Feedback to us. And I want to feed to the students. And an important point to make here, when I asked uh, Priyanka to get a group of students together, I asked for the top students, the best students. Because often when we design programs, we design them thinking about the worst students and to just bring them up to par. But we're not taking, we're not expanding the boundaries, we're not taking the best students and making them better. And, and, and I don't know if I'm right in that view, but I just thought, let's get the best, let's get the better students and let's see what they think about e-learning and what they will require from it. And let that be our yardstick, rather than, as we're discussing over tea, when you ask students what they want, they'll want the bare minimum. But the good students don't want the bare minimum. But I think it is interesting, again, just because my daughter's going through the system and uh, she's one of the better students, and how often she'll say she goes to a lecture and there is no one there except the guys who she knows are all doing well. And so you sometimes say, well, why, and I don't know what the answer is, but why are the poor performing students who have equal opportunity to be at that thing not actually there? Now, there may be other reasons for it, but you know, part of it, whether that's laziness or just bad upbringing and how you learn, or you know, but as you say, if you want to try and understand, maybe as a first hit, is look at that group who are really passionate yeah, about learning, what it is. you know, and maybe a second one can take a lower band and say, So, what's going wrong? I think that's the idea. I think, I think this is a pilot study, this group. And if it works out well, if we have some good traction, then we'll take it forward next year into a, into a broader study. But yeah, so that's the idea. So so it's going to go from here to the, who's the next group? Here? The technical group. Sorry. The technical group. Will be the ICS group. guys. Mm-hmm. The ICS guys, and then we're going to have the student group, and we might have a comeback after that. So is it all today? No, no, no. It's over the next month. It's all today. Should open today. today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> three, three hours. Three, three, three hours. hours. <laughs> 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 so, so, so that's the plan. So, so I think for. So after Joseph uh, speaks on the last sort of ideas that we had, let's move forward and try and see how we can move proactively and let's get some ideas of how we can drive this policy. Because, uh, you know, it's been going on for a long time. Yeah, it's been a year. And there doesn't seem to be any... Uh, I don't know what the problem is. Uh, I'm not on this committee, but I don't know what the problem is. Why don't we have an e-learning policy? And if we... And I, and I made this comment the other day. And if we want to play in the same space as the top five and stay in the top we always measure ourselves mm. that we have to get the space right we have to get it right uh, you know we were the largest we were one of the largest universities in africa yeah. uh, but we're not getting this right and this is the future and another point i want to make you know one of the key and i was speaking to people from the accounting profession and what has really struck me is that these guys this is like a from maybe not Cyprus official view, but these are members of who said that you know accounting as a as an academic profession is dead. There's no future for it because it's it, it is almost it's an automated process. Mm-hmm. It's a skill, and it's been taken over by intelligent systems. Mm-hmm. An expert system can do your books. In the of 99% of people, books can be done by you put it in the data and it gives you a tax returns or does whatever it is. So so accountants need to relook at what they're doing. It's the same for many other skills based. And one of the things I've heard 
uh, 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 the Minister of Education said, various high-level people, they keep talking about skills development. And it strikes me as, are we a skills development? Is our universities for skills development or are we for learning and education? You know, and, and if we start thinking skills development, then it's a different thing. Then, it, then it's not a university anymore. And, and I think that's where we were talking earlier. We got it very clearly. Uh, is this about massification and training, yeah. or is this about learning and education? Yeah. And then, if you want to get this policy right, that has to be decided. But I do think there are going to be two <coughs> views different, on this. Different. Because the one is a financial, yeah. and Absolutely. the other one is. Okay. And we're in the stage of a tr uh, an evolving university and ironically it almost looks like we're going back to those old days where universities are going to become smaller and smaller mm. and they, we've got rid of technical colleges but we're going to end up with big training things that yeah. push you through and I see that's going to happen because you can't do both. Or it's okay, but that's the future. Let's, let's take Joseph the last point. Yeah. No, I, think the I, was just, I just wanted to contribute to Craig's point early on talking about the idea of the why and this is why most of the times when I look at the whole concept of e-learning or blended learning approaches in <laughs> academic institutes. In talking about it, I think the, um, the starting point, like I said earlier on, the starting point should not be just doing it because currently a lot of academics feel like it's a fancying thing up. Yeah. Oh, there's e-learning, let me also do it, let me also do it. But it should actually come from a deeper appreciation. Yeah. And that deeper appreciation is what I was saying before is the idea of disruption, is that this is what is coming in. He mentioned earlier on a point is, look, let's look at our, our students. What is the current student like? How do they actually learn? How, what are their approaches? And in appreciating the student and focusing on the student, then you come to realize, oh, I think times are changing and maybe the way we do things should change a little bit. And then when that comes in, it starts building that appreciation where we appreciate that, look, universities are being disrupted by the way we do things. And students are taking this knowledge from a particular, in a particular way. And that's when they, I think the academic also starts to appreciate more why they should jump onto this bandwagon of e-learning, of blended learning approaches. And I also mentioned the idea of, you know, when we, I, I suppose it's, the term is being used loosely, the e-learning and e-learning. And most academics, when you hear e-learning, again, it signals I'm being replaced. It's, electronic learning rather than traditional university blended learning oh okay so my role is actually changing and i think lastly was the point that he mentioned which i think even in policy going forward somehow maybe could be included is there needs to be appreciation of customization students the, the way these 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 tools are going to be used the way the approaches are going to come in is going to be different in all situations. So it can't be a one size fits all because then everybody's just thinking, oh, okay, I've done that, tick the box and I've yeah. done it. So I think that is what I want to just contribute on. In terms of policy, I think it would be, well, it would be great for me, um, <laughs> is if we had, if we looked at, at ICS and we allocated an ICS person to a school or to a discipline or to a whatever so that because I phone 4,000 and I ask someone how to do it and then I put the phone down and then I still can't do it so I phone 4,000 and then it's a new person who's telling me and whatever and like we have when I need to deal with leave issues I have an HR person who is allocated to my school who I have a relationship with and I can talk to I want to be able to phone an ICS person and say I've got this crazy idea, mm. I want to do this, but I don't know how to do it. And I want that person to understand exactly as you're saying, to understand the discipline or the school or the ethos or the whatever. And it's going to be different mm. for different. for different yeah. schools. And so in terms of a policy, if we could have, I think, I know Rabbi always talks about the problem of working in silos and ICS is like, those people at the end of 4,000 who I try not to speak to if possible. No, I'm terrified of 4,000 because, and then they ask me to do things and, you know, and like it's hit and miss whether I get it right. If we had, if it was a team, so you had the, the how people, the ICS people, and the why people, the academics, and we worked as a team on, on e-learning, blended learning, whatever we call it, it would, 
because we do have ideas, but we don't know how to make them work. The ICS have got all the skills of how to yes. do this stuff, mm. but they can't come and march into my office and say, look, I've seen your Moodle and it's not yes. working. Yeah. Cool. So it would be so nice <coughs> if we had that kind of relationship and, and again, that customization relationship. So I don't know if that's something that we can do in the policy where ICS is devolved or decentralized or belongs to schools, not belongs, but works attached. with schools, attached. Yeah. <clears throat> just to, I'm sorry, I just want to pick up on that because um, I think what you're saying is very important. And I don't think raised earlier, one of the problems we've got is that not everyone understands technology and that's going to be a huge barrier. But the problem is, in the past, is it would be ICS. ICS doesn't understand teaching okay. and I don't really understand your content, so they come and say, Look, we've got clickers for you, mm -hmm. or we've got Moodle for you. So that's not their fault. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how many you're familiar. There's a, there's a model called TPAT, mm -hmm. which is basically trying to look at how all of these things come together. And it's got three parts. It's got techn technology knowledge, pedagogy knowledge, and content knowledge. And to me, what has to happen is, as, as the lecturer, we are the ones with content knowledge and hopefully pedagogy, pedagogy knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's what we've got to, not always, but that's what we want to have. The RT people, if all they are is with technical knowledge, it's not good enough. What you actually want is you want an instructional designer. They have technical and pedagogy knowledge. So if you have someone from there allocated who is technical, understands the concept of doing this properly online or blended or whatever, plus you've got, so your common language now is the pedagogy, is how you're teaching. But I'm bringing the content, you're doing the, the hard lifting in, in, in the technical environment. And I think if we can have a policy that says, and again, it can't just be a you know, 4,000 who's there. Yeah. It actually needs to be yeah, your school, understand. your discipline has an instructional designer allocated to you and you have a common language. You can talk mm. across the, the sort of pedagogic uh, uh, interface. So before I come to you, there's one point I want to make. I mean, I've been reading on this issue in research. It strikes me that the leading universities of the world who have e-learning built into their DNA, so to speak, all have what is called the Office of Technology in Education, or yes. something equivalent. Not ICS. Mm -hmm. yeah, ICS yes. manages the university back-end systems. Yeah, exactly. You know, that is their job. But the technology in education is that thing. special stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Instructional designers, people are there to help you design your course, so understand yeah. pedagogy, exactly. understand exactly. technology. <clears throat> we don't have that at our university. They're interested in effectiveness. Yes. And so they're not those ICS who are trying to make you efficient. ICS are the guys who, who, who's, who put in the back support the Office of Technology and Education. Absolutely. But yes. they will decide we want this and they and they will and ICS's job is to make it efficient. But OTE, Office of Technology and Education, is to make what we do effective. And you see the reason we don't do this is we modeled on business. Right. Business doesn't have this other thing. Business has an IT department. Mm -hmm. So we've got an IT department. Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier, that doesn't work. You actually need this specialist IT Understand. department because we're in the game of education. We're not in the game of profit. We're not in the game of efficiency, and until we have that, we actually have a hole, and we're going to have people that can't do this. Right? That's incredible. No, no, it's fine. There's no order here. Okay. I decide. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to pick up on the issue of disruption because I think there's some very useful um, shifts happening here. But I'm trying to think in my mind who should drive the process in terms of moving forward. And to me, it's 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 the disruption is to our pedagogy and our assessment and our engagement with students. And so, so, so that seems to be where we need to change the why. The focus on moving away from this, this examination yeah. kind of mania, oh. where you feel as though you've got to have an exam, which and then tends to test content. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think we've got to break that mold. Um, and, and of course, then we're coming up with this issue of effort, because, because it's not just a trivial exercise of the academics need to engage with that. So to me, that should be the driver. And then we put the support systems around that. I think you raise a very important point, which is something I've raised before as well, is this, our entire academic outlook from the time we start teaching at the beginning of the year is designed towards an exam. Exactly. Yeah. My students are banned from asking the question in class, is this an exam? Yeah. I just refuse to answer that question. Right? Every answer is yes. yes. Uh, because if you say it's not, it's oh, just a job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the whole point about the learning experience is lost. And this is what happens with Moodle. This is what seems to happen with Moodle as well. You can't test something unless it's on Moodle. And that for me is just wrong because you should be able to test what you do in class. Wow. But that's where the real learning takes place. The knowledge repository is Moodle. That's a different thing. It's a knowledge, it's an information repository. 
the knowledge generation <coughs> and the wisdom, the acquisition of wisdom comes in class. That's our job. Okay, uh-huh. and certainly in our university, we're not a we're not a MOOC, for example. But but uh, but uh, this 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 thing about examination and assessment, it's a big thing. Uh, we're not going to solve that problem here, but it is a real problem, and that drives. If we are all honest mm-hmm. with ourselves, especially in first and second year, we're driven by that examination. Also, at the end of the year, when when uh, the uh, QPA comes and asks you your pass rate, or you can write reports on a low pass yeah. rate, mm-hmm. you'd rather have a high pass rate so you don't have to write the report. Mm-hmm. But don't have it too high because you'll have to write a report well, as well. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> and, and, and it's driven by these these it's things, and, and sometimes pedagogy or the learning, you know. And pedagogy is, is a sort of maybe a technical word, and all of us are not educators. We don't have formal education no. qualifications. Some of us do. But I think many of us know how to teach just through experience mm. and, 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 and to ensure that our students learn. And we need to drive that process. Um, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> uh, to go forward, we could also just be practical about this. I don't know whether we've done uh, taken, say, uh, comparative policies from other universities. Just look at what's there. It doesn't mean we're going to adopt it, mm. but it, it, it does, uh, seeing that we are so much in the infancy stage of thinking about an e-learning uh, policy. So I don't know if, if the, the team has even looked at, at, at UCT and if, if they have a policy. The other thing is, just from my experience of being um, uh, a reviewer on the quality enhancement project for the CHE. Um, I was privileged to um, visit the uh, um, to visit Free State University. Now they're a relatively small university, um, and historically and oh well, recently have had their own challenges and what have you. But in 2015, now this may not touch the deeper issues of what is e-learning. But it's remarkable that in 2015, when we had the fees must fall chaos and, and there was a disruption to the classes, within three weeks, they were able to get all their content mm. to students online. But why it goes back to what Haley um, uh, uh, raised is that each faculty has what you pointed out. You have somebody who's an an IT and an instructional designer Mm -hmm. who is helping the, well, they have a faculty system helping the department Mm -hmm. um, as part of the broader teaching and learning um, initiative. And in fact, I think they are placed there by the equivalent of um, uh, UTLO. Mm -hmm. By you know, uh, or, or or really the uh, teaching and learning unit office, office right? Uh, so they have that in place, um, and I've seen something very similar at the University of Warwick in the UK, where a lecturer can go into the teaching and learning unit and say, "I'm got a series of lectures coming up. How can you assist me yeah. with, with with blended <laughs> learning?" Okay. You know. And so even if you have no background in this, they would, they would take yeah. you through that. So I think a policy <coughs> would start to touch upon um, these kinds of um, offerings that we need to have in place as a very basic structure before we can even yeah. think of going forward. Do, do you think a policy should include, because you had made the point right at the beginning about yeah. attendance, mm-hmm. should a policy include an issue about attendance? And, uh, should we force attendance? When I spoke to ICS about it, they said, oh, it's very easy. We, we can ensure people and we can take a record. Is that necessary? But yeah. Yeah, I just want to uh, respond to what Joseph and Prof. Mm-hmm. Pille said. You know, um, this so-called committee was formed and it was driven by ICT. So the chair of this committee was a guy from ICT, so that he also is involved in every aspect of coming with a policy. But not an educator. Not a but, but yeah, he's not an educator. He's from academic computing. He was from academic Yes, he was from academic yes, computer. Yes. Yeah. He was also from the committee. Yeah. So there, there were policies that we looked at. Yes. Now we have policies of other universities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, the, the the biggest thing in I mean in the in the meetings there was an argument that whether we need an e learning policy or should a should a strategic document or guidelines would be enough because there are so many policies in place yeah. already and would people like to have another policy? That was the QPS argument. And then we, we said, okay, let's come up with a self-assessment policy to see 
what do we have in South Africa, for example, now? And we saw that only three universities have an e-learning policy. UCT, um, you have your WITS and University of Pretoria, who have like, and they are also recent policies. <coughs> Does Tlenbosch have one? Yeah. So they are also not really the top five. Yeah. Perhaps. So they don't. Have, it's not very prescriptive. They are also in the infancy, and they are also coming developing the policy and uh, to, uh, because um, e-learning as such is new. But what was very interesting to note is that in our own university in health sciences there is a program in masters in community health or something, which is hundred percent e-learning. They have eighty five students registered from different countries across the world. And it's passed through the QPA, it's passed through higher education and all the structures in place. And that was uh, news to me that we have uh, online, yes, obviously it's a master's program, dissertations can be read across, you know, and they have like 25% contact and which happens on Skype or uh, a meeting with the supervisor on a virtual basis. So uh, that's where we are now. So there's no definite... Uh, um, progress in that regard. But if, if you had to, so so four, of, well, four of the universities you mentioned, uh, these are four of the top five, and we are, yeah. we are one of them, that have a policy. It is in its infancy, we agree, because the whole concept is in its infancy in the country. But are you suggesting that we need a policy or we don't? Because when I spoke with ICS, one of the first things they said was, we can't do anything, we don't have a policy. Uh, so they don't know what to do. They, you know, as we said earlier, they try something, and they'll try something else because they want to be proactive, but uh, it doesn't work. And one of the issues they raised, for example, was one of the issues raised in that uh, last week you know, in, in interviews was uh, Turnitin. You know, we often get these emails, Turnitin is overloaded. This mm -hmm. thing. So I asked uh, Abdullah, I says, why is this the case? He said, but we don't have a policy. So why do you need a policy? He said, well, we need a policy to say who is allowed to sign on mm -hmm. and what are the rules for, for joining Turnitin. Uh, at the moment, they make ad hoc rules, mm. and uh, and there's nothing driving the the a, a a policy that says you have to sign on with your UKZN uh, email mm -hmm. address, for example. Mm. So people sign on multiply with multiple addresses, because students they don't know how to use Turnitin. They sign on with a Gmail address, they sign on with UKZN yeah. address, a Yahoo address, and then they get 100 percent similarity <laughs> and they're shocked. <laughs> you know? So so there's this kind of stuff behind it as well. So they say there's no policy. Uh, but yet you say that the, 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 the head of that committee was driven by academic committee, but they're part of ICS. Yeah, they're part of ICS. They're part of ICS. So, so there's this, there's this disjunction. Okay? I was just going to say, on, from the discussion, I mean, it may be going backwards to have an e-learning policy. Shouldn't we have a learning policy? You know, shouldn't this be part of, it's not this component on the side that we're going to do some of us and some of us not. It's part of learning mm -hmm. and we're going to be a blended environment mm -hmm. or we're going to be. So it worries me a little bit to have an e-learning policy because it's like there are lots of policies that you didn't just ignore. So it needs to be incorporated yeah, into your learning. Yeah. Do. This is yeah. what we do. Mm -hmm. So that was the one thing. And then you touched on it about the students. I think in addition to the, so if the academics are here and ICS is allocating and supporting, we, uh, my daughter's in high school, and um, I'm shocked at the lack of teaching about how to use technology. I mean, she can use Instagram and Facebook and all of that, but cut and paste from the internet for a project, no problem. We don't need to worry about plagiarism or referencing or anything like that. And so what we expect, and, and I think we do this in a lot of ways, we expect students to finish matric, then they have a six-week holiday where they just get drunk, and then they start first semester and we say, right, put your essays on, turn it in. And What is that? I mean, so part of the policy also needs to build into it some sort of training for students in that first week or sure. first... You yeah, I know, don't know, you know... When because I, we can't expect them to engage with technology when, even if they're very good on phones and things, mm. you have to, as you say, you have to learn how to do turn it in. You have to learn how to do these things. And even the best students, they might be very, very good students, but they they haven't learned the, the language that we're expecting them to use. And so... But isn't the best way to learn is to do... So, so... If we had comprehensive documents online, and this is, you know, 
and, and students were asked to submit stuff by term 10 and we had a, a how-to document that drove them. Because do we really have time in class to teach this specific? We do. Now, let me give you an example. When I went, you guys will remember it when, I, when I first came to IST, the first thing we should teach Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this is a waste of time, teaching Word, Excel, PowerPoint to students because that was first year. So we cancel that. We teach IST, we teach proper mm -hmm. stuff and make sure they do their assignments in Word mm -hmm. and use Excel. And students learn it by themselves. Now, this, given it's an information technology stream, and other students might be less. Uh, but sometimes I think we've just got to stop holding hands. Uh, and, uh, and we've got to say, students, go and do this. And we, and we, we enforce it through some, through some kind of, if you're going to do assessments, through some kind of assessment. But then we process. punish them. That's well, the problem. Yeah. You say, put it, do your assignment on Turnitin in week three. They put their assignment on Turnitin, it comes back plagiarized, and you get naught. Where's the learning in that? We, we're not using, again, we're not using the Turnitin technology properly because the Turnitin technology should be a learning tool. It should be a, you can upload your document and then it can tell you that there's a similarity index and then you take it down and you engage with it and whatever. But we, we're so driven, as you said, by the assessment, examination and whatever. So if we had, I mean, what we do is the first assignment they do doesn't count for marks, but they have to submit it on Turnitin yeah, and, they, sorry, and it's... And yeah. that's Isn't what that they part have to of the do. learning process then? Yeah. Yes. So so we've built it in yeah. because we can't otherwise you sit in week six with mm -hmm. Two hundred and fifty yeah. yeah. plagiarized mm. essays, is. and the reason is because they've handed into Pinky Hotlips at Yahoo.com as well as the UKZN address as well as whatever. So we've had to to do this, mm. and 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 none of us are, are, are experts, you know. So so I think we have to support the students. No, course, not so in a punitive way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, 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 in, a, in, my, in my view, in an office for technology and education has those kind of support mm. structures yeah. built mm. into it. Yeah. So students have a place to go. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, rather than going to the lecture, go to mm. Hedy and say, listen, you got. Yeah, I've got two emails to, at midnight. You know, yeah, and I've today. got, you know, a problem with the turn it in. How do I fix it? That's not your job, really. Yeah. We have a technology and education office who have consultants. Who sit on whose job is to sit on the phone 24 7 if necessary to deal with these things one of the issues that came up with uh, this review we went through people were working at two o'clock in the morning technical people with, with students from from all over the world phoning say i can't upload i can't upload the document tomorrow and then they would phone the ics person which thomas uh, i think her name was Haley as well but it's a Haley, i think her name was and it's Haley. Haley. would say she'd get called at two o'clock in the morning to say i said why are you doing this i said we should be working clever not hard, you know, and uh, and uh, and it seems to me that because we technology becomes then a hindrance mm -hmm. rather than a facilitator, because Moodle is supposed to be working just like that. You you do your job. I'm not saying you don't do your job, but the job doesn't include being awake at two o'clock in the morning, waiting for submissions uh, to to Moodle on uh, of your assignments. That for me is just silly. But this is what was happening, and 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 ICS was trying to support them. Something's broken. Okay. Yes. Um, I think I'll add on what Haiti is saying here. For me, I think the, the, the key word here is integration. Uh. Um, firstly, I agree with you in terms of it, this is not just a separate policy. It's a policy within a learning policy. But again, with the issue of support. Now, the use of Tenet in shouldn't be divorced from um, how we teach students academic writing because it's really about that it's really about how they are not using how they're engaging with how what they read properly and then writing on that if we maximize on academic writing and then incorporate that the use of technology turn it in then i think we will win in, a, in some way because it's not divorced it's how you write um, that that gets you that similarity index. Mm -hmm. If you regurgitate what the authors you read are saying, uh, you have to remember that the, those authors were not answering the question you are answering. They were actually doing their own research. Mm -hmm. So if you understand that, then you write or uh, and articulate what they say differently because you are engaging with a different. You are reflecting on a different topic than what they were doing. So I think when we maximize our writing. Um, 
you know, when we teach them how to write, and I think the issue of turning it in will be solved. Mm -hmm. But do we teach students how to write? Is that part of what we do? We used to do that, but I don't know what happened. Really they, there used to be writing. academic writing yeah. um, workshops, but I think now, with turning it in in mind, we need to incorporate mm -hmm. those two. They shouldn't be separate, for example. And I think we are doing it separately. Actually, I agree with you because we in the foundation program we have a literacy module, yeah, and that's how we do the turn it in. Mm. So with us, it's more about this is how you learn how to write, read with understanding, mm. yes. read, write it in your own way, exactly, and you know submit it into. But Joseph, Turnitin. that's yeah. uh, how many people come to your yeah about literacy okay. module for your academy one so, eight, yeah. one sixty. On 60, yeah. and this is for the school or for the college? It's for the college. Mm -hmm. College of LMEs. Yes. Surely that's not... We have two for it. ...with the numbers so. of students. So, so, so while we tick the boxes, is it effective? I'm mean, going back to what Craig was saying. Is, 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 yes, it's important to have uh, academic writing support. Yeah. And, and we can tick the box that we have it. But it's really effective if you have 160 students in LMS, which is arguably the largest college at the university, mm -hmm. right, in terms of student numbers. Uh, 160 students, surely that's not the sum total of people no. who need help in that, in, in, in that domain. Yeah. So this is where I think we need to be careful over here. Uh, we can be idealistic about the way we look at things and say we have to teach people how to write. Of course we have to. And we have to teach people how to use Turnitin and we need to integrate all of this. But let's be pragmatic. At the end of the day, a policy has to incorporate a pragmatic approach to try to achieve a, a given given end, right? Uh, and 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 we, the given end is something Craig has pointed to. He's going to pipe up just now and say, "What is that end?" But let's let's keep that put aside for a moment. Let's assume we have an end in mind, then we have a policy to to achieve that end. Uh, and I want to just focus ourselves a little bit here. Let's not let's not be idealistic. I'm not saying that's not important, but let's be pragmatic over here. If you and we had, you know, a concrete uh, suggestion, an ICS support person or an OTE support person, not ICS, mm -hmm. probably from Office of Technology, an instructional designer, mm -hmm. professional person. We need to go find these people. They're not they're, they're hard to find, but we need to find these people. We need to train the people to come in and, uh, uh, you know, in each, in each college. Uh, then we spoke, Brian spoke about assessment. You know, if, is assessment driving our, our ethos as, as teachers? And is it necessary? Can we use an e-learning environment to, to get around uh, assessment? Because is assessment really achieving it? That's a bigger question, of yeah, course. Yeah. And, and it's not a question for us over here, but it is something raised. Yeah. Uh, then uh, there's uh, the issue of the technology support from ICS. I mean, remember, we're separating an Office of Technology and Education from ICS. Mm -hmm. ICS is ever willing to provide support. They'll talk of budgets and all this, but that's a normal issue. Forget about that but they need direction. Now we heard that there was a committee, maybe there is a committee, mm -hmm. but it sort of died. We also heard that you, the, the committee has evaluated other, or mm -hmm. at least read other policies. We know that four of the top five universities have a policy. We understand that the policy, uh, the whole concept in South Africa at least is in its infancy. The question we've got to ask ourselves here, do we think, and, and the point made by Heidi, we need a learning policy. I don't know uh, whether, we can incorporate, yes, a learning, but surely we have some kind of learning policy. Teaching and learning policy. Teaching and learning policy. We need to embed it in there. Yeah. But we need to embed it. E-learning has to be embedded in there, not as a separate Many universities, yeah. that's why they don't have e-learning policy. They embed the, you know, e-learning characteristics to the teaching. But is it? Yeah. I mean, is it? Yeah. Because a policy would, would drive adoption, or at least yeah. control Enforcing. adoption within yeah. certain parameters. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's ad hoc, which is what it seems to be at the moment, mm -hmm. then you get hit to me. So for example, we spent a lot of money on podcasting, as I mentioned earlier. While I was there as head of school driving the process it worked. As soon as I stopped, it stopped. Okay. Right? And 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 uh, it was used a little bit and it stopped. It still works by the way. You can still open a thing and, and have your stuff uh, recorded. But nobody bothers. Mm -hmm. Yet while I was there I went to different colleges, I gave talks, mm -hmm. everyone was excited we could do this, we could try it out. But there's nobody driving because it's not, in absence of policy, it becomes ad hominem. And, and that always fails because people get tired mm -hmm. and people get fed up. Right? So Joseph might be very enthusiastic and drives a particular thing. And while he's driving it, yeah. but something else catches interest, surely he should be able to move on. 
and not be not be shackled by his interest. And that's where we needed policy. So if you had a policy on podcasting, when we spent millions of rands from the university to develop it, it could be incorporated, and then it'll continue in whatever form it takes, it'll, it'll continue. And this is what I want to get at, perhaps before the end of the session. And, uh, you know, so so I, I want to drive this. Uh, could we have yeah, no, just to say that I think uh, to support what Heidi has said, and you, you just mentioned it now, that perhaps a recommendation that can come out of here is that the teaching and learning policy, which we do have, yeah. needs to be revisited mm. to incorporate uh, e-learning. I, I, I can't remember now, I was one of the people that helped draft the policy, but I don't recall, we may have just alluded to, to e-learning mm. as, a, as one of the modalities. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, we're talking about um, a substantial addition mm. to that. Because it's also a, a, it, it'll also have to be a policy that drives all the behaviors that we want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I come to Eddie, yeah. think, Professor, do we have a common understanding of what e-learning is? I mean, I have something in my head. Craig is something in all of us. Do we have a common understanding? If we, and, and if we have a common understanding here that we can define what we think e-learning is, maybe that could become okay, a starting so point. Can I counteract yeah. that to bit, Manoj? Yeah. Do we have a common understanding what learning is? Yeah. Well, that's also true. <laughs> yeah. so, so the same problem, yeah. you see. Yeah. Everyone, has a different, yeah. Yeah. Everyone has a different uh, idea. But should but we have a point where we kick off and say, yeah, we right. might disagree, but this is our definition of it from the university's yeah. perspective? Well, I, I, I think we've, we, we may not have um, come to a succinct um, idea at the moment, but we all have touched upon it. We touched upon uh, it, it, um, however we, we think about it, say whether it's blended learning or whatever, that it's, uh, that it's the use of technology to enhance mm -hmm. teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So it's about effectiveness, yeah. right? That's, that's what yeah. our yeah. feeling is. Yeah. But often we use it for efficiency. Yeah. And that is the, I think that, that is where we have this yeah. problem. Oh, I just been listening, I came a bit late so I didn't um, catch the beginning. I think I just want to explain what happened previously and, and how it actually reached here. The the e, the e learning team that was formed was formed by the from the, the head of academic computing at ICS who called together academics and not ICS people to try and develop an e learning policy. And we had a couple of meetings and we we went through a few things in there. And what came out very strongly at the meetings there was that we shouldn't have a policy, but we should have guidelines that people. Um, uh, should follow when they're adopting e-learning, which as you said would feed into the teaching and learning policy rather than having a separate policy. Um, for some reason or the other, when this, when that recommendation went to the teaching and learning steering group, I think it was, um, at the DVC they said that it shouldn't be sitting in ICS, but it should be sitting at UTLO, which is why I think it's now shifted mm -hmm. here. So I think the, a lot of the background work has already been done. It's really for us to try and get hold of what happened at those meetings and then to move forward from there in terms of what we think needs yeah. to I think just some clarity, it hasn't shifted here. There's no formal sort of, this is just my outlook. I applied for funding or funding and it said, let's do this. There was no direction from Ravi or Bala mm. Okay, there has been a it. director from the DVC that policy should not be developed by ICS. Correct. Okay. It should Correct. be developed by UTL. Okay. Okay. So, so, well, this makes sense then, but mm. I, I wasn't aware. Okay. Yeah. 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 They didn't drive the this sort of format and this discussion. But it's good to know that it has some value. Mm. Uh, and it, I, I was yeah. also sorry. sorry. Second, yeah. um, there has been an advert that has been drawn up for an instructional designer, which we were supposed to advertise in January last year. And instructional One instructor for the whole university. Well, the idea was that uh, Ravi and I were working on it because <coughs> I, I suggested to him that we should have one at the co in our college uh, because I, I, I was doing the e-assessment. And he said to me he would try and get the funding for it. Uh, uh, we had approved by HR for advertising but then the funding got withdrawn. So there is um an no, that's a problem you can talk about this talk but there's no money to support it. Can be used, Whatever. Which you can yeah. manipulate to get mm -hmm. an instructional design. Uh, that's disappointing though because clearly there's there's, there's some thought given to the concept of instructional yeah. design. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a critical instructional design if you go on the web it's a massive business. I mean, there are, there's companies that just do instructional yeah. design for you. Well, the post that we initially created with Joseph 
uh, was for him to be an instructional designer, but again, there was no funding. So what we did was, what I did was, was used uh, money from uh, the access program yes, to, to fund that part-time position. But then uh, because he was doing an access job primarily, he kind of got absorbed into that function. But we also got to the stage where HR in our college um, approved such a position, and they even wrote it up as a, as a formal post, uh, it's just about getting the, 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 the money for it. Well, I think the money is driven by a policy. You know, if, if there's a university policy that says we should have this, yeah. then, it becomes, then money will be found. Mm. But right now, you're asking for favors yeah. from somebody to find the money here and there, etc. So this is why, yeah. if even if they're guidelines, or, or yeah. it's, if it's a framework, or it's a, 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 it will be part, become part of the teaching and learning policy. It will then have to go to the colleges, who will then have a sight of this and realize that we've got to fund it, and it will have to go to Senate. And at Senate, if it's approved, then you also have to approve the funding of it. Yeah. You yes. see? But we have to get a, a, a well drafted um, guidelines. guidelines that, that, that go into you must it. understand, uh, I think, you must understand that the role of this series of meetings, it, it, there's no, uh, it's not formal in a sense. Mm -hmm. We've not been mandated to do anything. This is just research, a pilot study, if you will. If we can, if we can influence decisions, well and good. But we have no mandate to do that. I think we must understand. Okay. Maybe? Well, it's just if uh, that sort of stops where I was going. But um, no, if we had a policy, yeah. whatever it looked like, um, you know, we we I think we part of the teaching and learning policy that every student at UKZN must have a laptop. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that in addition to that. It must be every student at UKZN must know how to use a laptop. So, <laughs> and the things that we use laptops for, like Turnitin and whatever. So, and again, I agree. I don't want to be teaching students how to do Turnitin. I've got much more important things to teach them, you know, Socrates. Um, <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if students, knowing oh, I'm going to UKZN, knowing I've got to have a laptop, then had to go to ICS and have a session or a workshop or whatever and so shift the responsibility to the students at lots of universities you have language proficiency entrance requirements you have this kind of entrance requirement so make technology, technology part of not necessarily an entrance requirement but that in your first two weeks of university you have to attend these sort of workshops and then mm. and and so it gets done. It doesn't get done by academics who are not good at doing it and are not interested in doing it. It gets done by professional ICS people who know how to do that stuff. So the responsibility shifts back to the students because I think that's what you were saying is let's not handhold. But it's a requirement and maybe it's a at the end of it, you know, they have to tick a box because we tick so many boxes. Make our students tick some boxes that if we had a policy that said UKZN takes seriously blended e-learning, whatever, students are expected within the first six weeks to have attended whatever session. <coughs> Build it in so that the, it's you not know, just uh, us. One of the issues, one of my doctoral students from one of the neighboring universities, they have this policy <coughs> of laptop per, per, per student. Within the first two weeks, the students all sold it. Most yeah, of the students sold their laptops. Too. Yeah. They sold it because, Some, you know, was the they as well. just managed yeah. because there was no nothing to drive exactly. to force them to use it. Yeah. And, and obviously, probably half none of the lecturers are even probably making use of them in yes. any useful well, way. No it's just moved along. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I there, there might be there might be room for that. There might be room for getting people smartphones, for example, mm. rather than laptops. But but whatever it is, it needs to be because a few years ago, when when Prof Vital was here, it was a laptop for every student. Mm -hmm. Then it became wireless across the entire university, and everybody will have a smart device, a, a, a iPad, like you know, mm -hmm. unnecessary iPad. But the, these things keep changing, and and there's no there's no structure to these thought processes. Mm -hmm. If there was something now, the, and that's why students get laptops because it's part of the funding, and the other students don't. Now, those of those of us who can afford to buy for our children do. But those who can't afford it, 
Are they getting left behind? But what happens that because it's not part of your policy and nobody has it, you can't build that into your requirements because then you're disadvantaging students who can't afford it. And that becomes a, that becomes a real social issue. If you build your course to be totally online, for example, and you require access to a computer, but some students can't afford a computer, they're not in this fast funding, their parents can't afford computers, do those students get left behind? Uh, is that is that more justifiable? So these are these are these are yeah. fundamental. If we're going to have a policy that says, you know, first year students will have to access the online forum, then either we need to make sure we have adequate access on campus, in other words, with land nodes, or we need to make sure that they have access to computers, mm -hmm. and we need a policy to drive that. Whether we can force them to learn on something is a separate issue, but but yeah. that's that's a valid point as well. Because there's a student perception perception issue to what Hayden said. I was reading an article. A research was conducted in Western Cape, UWC, and Stirling Post University. And of all the students who were surveyed, only 2.67% believed that they need computer support. And I am a testament to that because in 2017, my school said, okay, all the students coming from different schools, let's have three days of computer activity for them. So I booked the land, I got ICS people coming from Howard College. Of the 847 students, two turned up. Two. Two. Oh my God. And then and I they want... were probably capable. <laughs> yeah, they were probably capable. And, and I wanted to know, like, why? Why? Because this was advertised so well and everything. They said, no, we don't need computer support. We all know computer. We learn it at school. Yeah, I call Instagram. And, uh, <laughs> so that's a perception. You know, yeah. students will never agree yeah. that, you know, they have a problem. Uh, well, yes, turn it is different. Don't. Maybe they don't. I mean... Uh, yeah. But but two out of eight forty seven seems to be yes. a little bit uh, a, a little <laughs> low. Uh, so maybe she just didn't bother telling. I want to propose something that maybe won't be liked and is obviously quite different uh, sure. for trying to make this work. There's a whole lot of challenges when it comes to doing this whole whether you call it e-learning, blended learning, etc. We've mentioned some of them, uh, like how much you can put online and we have face to face university, etc. The Brian mentioned assessment. The whole thing really starts to fall apart if you just. Uh, content regurgitation types of, so you've got to change that or, or scrap the exam um, then there's our evaluations we get judged on pass rates so do you even go down this route um, I, I wanted to do some ex more interesting stuff on Moodle I wanted to put some plugins in if holy you grail you don't touch Moodle I spoke to them we worried it's stable <laughs> don't yeah, put the yeah, plugins yeah. in but these plugins are amazing because they can do some and I understand that and so with all of these things what happens is you've you feel so restricted yeah. besides the risk and being penalized on your on your performance and you like you just play now this thing's never going to work if it's all we do is just, just little yeah. little tweaks yeah. i mean not at the rate it's moving now in the olden days we used to have a thing called the innovation foundation it was you know it was a different thing but people would go there and wanted to start a business linked to the university and blah 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 and then i'm wondering whether there isn't a concept whereby whether that's a foundation or whatever, but even individual lecturers can sign up to be part of, uh, for one of a better, innovation, teaching and learning uh, foundation program. So when I take my course and I'm on this and maybe students have to be informed, this is the same content, but it's an innovative course. And, all, and if you're in that, you actually fall out of a lot of these rules. So maybe there's a separate Moodle server where we can be playing. You're not judged on pass rates, you can assess in different ways because if we can't somehow create a space mm. to actually Sadness. push those things, we're never ever going to move anywhere. You know, but we're only going to be able to do that if we've got a place where it's okay. You know, one of the things I'm very powerful of, uh, you know, one of these pedagogies is very important to me is this pedagogy of correction and learning through mistakes. Mm. But we mm. can't do this here because you're terrified either in one sense or you just can't because it's too locked down. You know, so whether there would be, a, and even if that was a policy thing, so it's, okay, you're a, an RTL lecturer, an innovative teaching and learning lecturer, therefore, under the policy, because you've gone with that and you've registered your, your course with this, you are going to be judged, monitored, controlled, whatever, in a slightly different way. So that might be far too crazy for the university, it, but... Mm. We've sort of all accepted that Moodle is the de facto teaching of learning support software. Yeah. But it seems to me that many of our issues are driven because when something is free, it's not really free. Because the most expensive thing on any software is the human support. Yes. It's not the software itself. Okay. Now we get Moodle for free, so to speak, but we don't have the, the, the level of staffing message to support Moodle. 
it's an ad hoc thing. There, there's, there's one person in ICS, maybe two. Okay, is that enough? But if you had Blackboard or something equivalent, and you paid a million rand a year, but you're getting all that support mm -hmm. from from the, from an organization that are, now there are smaller universities than us, uh, and even bigger universities that, that use Blackboard. Yeah. For mm -hmm. They've obviously done a, a study of it and said, listen, Moodle is fine if you prepare to tinker and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff all the time. But uh, to have a stable support, I use Dropbox, for example. I don't use Moodle because I really can't trust mm -hmm. Moodle that will be up all the time for my postgrad students. And if it's just a matter of putting stuff online for the students, I'd rather use Dropbox. It's controlled by an outside entity. It's a big organization and it's never been down in the 10 years of using it. So the point I'm making is, and, and also on the point you made, I mean, on this uh, interviews last week, one of the issues came up was staff want to add videos to Moodle. And they're told, no, you can't do that. We're waiting for the latest version of Moodle. And when we when we upload the latest version and get it stable, then you can do this. This was about live capturing a video, you know, in class, mm -hmm. classes. That for me is, you know, if you had Blackboard, you'd just say, okay, fine, you do it because it's already built in. Mm -hmm. Now we're waiting for somebody to design it in the new version, test it. And I don't know if that is necessarily the way we want to go. But that's just an open question. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a matter of interest, um, our DVC is seriously thinking of bringing in Blackboard into the GSB, Correct. right? Uh, I did raise a concern that this should actually be driven institutional wide. But um, as you know, uh, the GSB is now becoming semi-autonomous and that's been passed by council. And he feels that we, we're going to wait for these things to be driven at the institutional level. We're never going to get anywhere. And even though it may cost us a lot, uh, there are serious advantages to getting to using Blackboard. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed um, when looking at Edinburgh University, they use Blackboard. Yeah. Every university of technology in the country, in South Africa, yeah. uses yeah. Blackboard. Yeah. We use Moodle because the argument was it's free, <laughs> but it's not it's actually. Free. It's actually costs us money. It costs us a lot of money. But anyway, that is... Um, and a policy document or a guideline document that we, that, that, that we want to propose, I really think Moodle is not helping us. Mm. Let me be brutally honest about this. It's not helping us because there's too much of effort and, 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 and it all falls on ICS, I mean, mm. as it should. But yet, if we had Blackboard, we'd pay for support right. from an outside entity yeah. whose yeah. job is to provide 24-7 support. Here, we've got staff sitting up at 2 in the morning because Moodle doesn't yeah. work. Mm. But Moodle... Yeah, and also, they're afraid to tweak with it or do anything interesting yes. with it because, understandably, you can't let it fall down when you've got everyone relying on their yes. notes and content being there. Yeah. Yeah. So when I ask this, they're like... We hey, developed we'll a system through UTLO on tracking students using artificial intelligence. To a large extent, Blackboard's already doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we haven't even perfected the system yet, and it's going on five years. <laughs> No, this we we, we are reinventing the wheel. We we should be we should be batting yeah. clever at the university. If we had invested in Blackboard five ten years ago, whatever it was, and spent a million rand a year, we would be way down the road in terms of our learning management systems, and we wouldn't have this burden on academic staff because right now a significant there's a significant burden on staff when using uh, Blackboard, especially those staff who are not fully. Yeah, the middle is not friendly. It's not, it's not, yeah, they're not. I, you're IT IT capable. Let's put it that way. You know. Yeah. I mean. So, so, so this is this is for me a a a, a serious issue. Any other views on Moodle? I mean, so we have to think about it. But well, yeah. uh, I'll give you an example of an experience I had at uh, Age Hill University in the UK. I first um, made contact with them in 2012, and came back excitedly because. They were using Moodle, but they'd created um, an outer interface that looked very user-friendly. Mm -hmm. And I came back and I mentioned this to the Teaching and Learning Strategy Committee that perhaps ICS should do that because Moodle's not very user-friendly. And they told me, no, this is Moodle at, at AGL, but we've made it user-friendly. When I went back, well, I spent a month last year on sabbatical, and they got rid of Moodle, and they're using Blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> got so friendly. <laughs> so they obviously realized that they were putting a lot of money into customizing this. 
Yeah. Now that's why, you know, we had the conversation earlier. I mean, I use Moodle, I would do quite effectively, but I'm an IT person. Yeah, and yeah. even there, it's been a pain. And even yeah. then, I, I, if I haven't done something for a while, forget. Yeah. And I've got to go Google it. I'm like, I can't believe that's how you actually do it. <laughs> but, um, and that's why the only way this would work is we have to have really skilled instructional designers. You, we will never get the staff to do that. It's yeah. just not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And they literally going to have to, okay, here's my content. Well. I'd like a quiz. Someone talked about a forum. I'd like this. And they would do it. You've got more chance of them being able to possibly do it in a blackboard or another environment. But if we're not, we're going to have to probably take some of that million bikes and get not one instruction on it because the amount of time right. just to do that for one person's course, course is massive. Yeah. We don't have to get a team of these people who are working on this. I mean, if I just give you an eight week course and say, put this and help me with it online, it's going to take them eight weeks of, yeah, of no, working so. for Listen, one person. I'm designing, I'm, as I said, I'm doing my honors course for next June next year, I'm designing it now using uh, Articulate. I've got the free version, I'm going to buy the version. I mean, I've got the trial version. It's a huge amount of work. And I consider myself an IT expert, if you will. Okay? I can read, I can do the stuff, I can understand it. But it's a huge amount of work. It's just work. It's just not, it's not conceptually hard uh, for me, but it's just work. It's, you've got to do it. And this is a problem, you know, if, if, you, if academics want to concentrate on the academic side of their job, the Socratic side of their job, and I have no problem with that, we have to do that, but we have to be relieved of this other stuff. Yeah. But by using so-called free stuff, it's not free, it's costing us money, it's costing us time, it's costing the university. It's actually, if we had to do a cost-benefit analysis of Moodle, I think it'll cost us more per year in terms of man-hours than it would just by buying Blackboard and buying a contract. And somebody needs to replace it. Yeah, um, I just want to add on to what you said earlier on uh, regarding how Moodle can actually be quite frustrating for academics. And uh, I sort of get the feeling that the, this whole with this whole e-learning thing and Moodle, it's not really something that the university is really taking up seriously. Mm. Um, we have a lot of older staff in our department, and they don't just they just don't want to engage with it. They usually ask the the younger st staff to actually do this, the work mm. for them. And I feel like if, as, as a possible solution, we, we attend, I attended the UEIP thing in 2015, perhaps uh, you, and none, none of this whole e-learning thing was mentioned there. It was all about um, all these pr courses that we did, but there was no emphasis on e-learning and, and how the university is wanting to implement this blended so approach. So this is those courses that new lectures have to yes. go through? Yes. yes. Oh, correct. Yeah. So there was no mention of this. So you just come into a system, um, you, you get all this other information, and then on the first day in, cl in class, you're told now that you have to upload the slides on Moodle, and you have no idea what it is. So perhaps another approach by the university itself, especially with now that we're talking policy, is that I really feel if it were policy, it would be better implemented because then it would sort of, if we had, for example, department specific or school specific people to help with these things, and it would help the people we take on into the university be better equipped. And because those are obviously the people that are going to spend a bit more time with the university. Because at the moment, as young as a young person, I'm sort of supposed to be comfortable with the technology, but even myself, I sometimes I you know tend to struggle with. Uh, you know the, the thing about this is if if we get this right, and, and to go back to the point of effectiveness. In other words, if we use technology to teach effectively, the other, which means we're going to get more people passing, more students passing, yeah. which means we get get a subsidy income, which means it pays for itself. So so we've got to take the long term view in terms of this funding thing. We need to look at a good policy, a good a good framework, whatever policy guidelines within which e-learning or technology is incorporated into a blended learning approach at the university. Mm -hmm. We need to show through some kind of longitudinal study that this leads to better pass rates, mm -hmm. which means if students are passing earlier in the career rather than six and seven years, in three and four years, mm -hmm. our subsidy income improves, mm -hmm. and this is just, it just pays for itself. Right now, we're just working, it's, it's mm -hmm. like you know, sh shooting fish in a barrel. You really don't know, you know what you're doing. You're taking a chance. And uh, something works, it works only because somebody's driving it and that person leaves. Mm -hmm. And this is the issue we had uh, last week in this. It was this, 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 this entire program was driven by one person and that person was not bad enough and the program was going to collapse because the person is not going to leave. And how do we, because we haven't institutionalized it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if Craig is running Moodle <coughs> for his course and he's doing such a great job for his course, 
But the minute he, he leaves that course and moves on, or retires, or whatever the case, or bus stops you for heaven's sake, it all collapses. Because we haven't institutionalized this again, and we have, we have this problem. With, I don't know if it's, um, I don't have experience at other universities, but some of you would have it. But uh, it, it's not a good thing. We, we talk of knowledge management, you know, as, as knowledge repositories. We don't, we're not doing that in our universe. There is no, there's no knowledge management policy. And uh, interestingly, one of the studies one of my doctoral students did was looked at knowledge management at the top 20 universities in Africa. <coughs> Turned out all top 20 were from South Africa. So we took top 10 from South Africa and top 10 from the rest of Africa. And we, we investigated the, how the university's success in terms of research and class rates and various measures. And uh, you found that the top universities consistently, and this is Cape Town, that's said such a, all had the equivalent of CIOs or CKOs, chief knowledge officers, on their staff, who were primarily academic people, not technical people. Our university has, well, we don't have CI at the moment, but when we did, it reported to the registrar's office or reported to the chief finance officer. Mm -hmm. And when it reports into people like that, you tend to understand the view. We know this, we teach this, right? You know, if you report to finance, then that's your view of technology. It's a, it's a cost center. It's not a strategic center. But yet these universities, the top universities in Africa, Makerere included, for example, had CIOs or CKOs reporting straight into the board or to the council and sat on the executive. This is something we don't have. Now, apparently there's a CIO being advertised uh, at the university. I, I don't know. We don't know where it's going to report it, probably the registrar office. But this for me is problematic. And it's something that, you know, uh, uh, you know I've commented on informally, but, but the university needs to take notice of this because that's what our research shows. And if we're not going to take cognizance of this research, so what's the purpose of us doing this research? You know, and, uh, and uh, we need to have somebody. We had a CIO one time, a few years ago, was it? this guy came from Dimension Data or something. Right, and he left equally fast because he couldn't integrate into this academic environment. Yeah, Johnny academics then understand academic. Richard Jansen. Jansen, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Richard Jansen. Yeah, yeah the, from my limited experience on, from academic leader and sort of looking up the university rather than down the university sure. is that I think that the description is ad hocery. I don't know if that's a real word, but whichever committee or whichever workshop or whichever anything I sit on, it seems that there's just this sticking band-aids over gaping wounds. And, and it's kind of this, and it's this, and it's this, and there isn't that. And I'm the last person to ask for centralization or any, because I like decentralization, I like all of that. But we sort of need that someone at the top or at the middle or somewhere who's who's got like an, a, a broader view of what's going on because I think we can all go back after this and, and be enthusiastic and passionate and ask why and everything else but as you say it depends on the personnel and and anything that depends on the personnel especially at UKZN is a really bad idea. Well it's so, a bad idea anyway. Mm. Yeah it's but a, you know, so, so if we had something that I mean as a new lecturer that you you had somewhere to go to figure out how to do this stuff it would be amazing because we don't have that mm. we, we don't have that go-to place mm. all right police we're gonna to have to shut down in 15 minutes what i want to do now is go around the table and just start with craig since we started with him if you have three things just three things that you have to say about the future of e-learning or whatever it is related to our discussions here, that you'd like us to take note of going forward Remembering that we're going to feed into the, uh, the technical guys and into the students and then try and get them. And maybe feed back into this committee later on again. Well, this could be Thumbs down on three things. Maximum, let me say maximum three things. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, um, maximum. <laughs> no, I, I would say, firstly, I would just use my little why, how, what I'd say, we, number one, we must all know individually and as a university why we actually want to do this. Uh, and if, if we can get on a common page with that, that's going to be a big thing. Um, the second thing is, what is we actually trying to achieve here? Is it blended learning? Is it e-learning? Is it, then comes to all the other discussions, is it effectiveness and massification? Is it, I mean, efficiency and massification, or is it effectiveness and, you know, 21st century learning? So that's it. And then the last thing is the how. We need to have 
some clear things that are in place that are steps that will make it easy for those who buy into it to take those steps you know and with the support that we've been talking about having that, that you know uh, educational technologist type person there or whatever and you know if we've got that in place i think we've got a why uh, what and how we can possibly take some steps forward so so to Craig is this is the foundational stuff so we can all just go home but I mean, <laughs> but but i think we, let's, we can talk about more specifics as we go around the table I was going to use the same three as Craig. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about this this issue of the policy, and, and so um, my sense is that the teaching and learning policy that's in place at the moment is a kind of I hesitate to use the word, but a kind of policing document which tries to enforce certain things, and it goes contrary to what what we're trying to do is get the a heartbeat uh -huh. of what it means to be a, a, a lecturer teacher, yeah. and so it's a my concern is that we're going to tack in a little bit on e-learning that's not going to fit into the policy. I really think that policy almost needs to be rethought um, holistically mm -hmm. as to, and, and e-learning, blended learning, whichever we use, actually becomes really at the core, mm -hmm. not, a, not an appendix. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Yes. okay. I would like to actually touch on the retention aspect and the throughput, throughput aspect. Uh, research in the University of Stanford showed that, you know, in a very difficult course on mechanics, when they use blended learning, the fail, uh, the the pass percentage, the the people, the percentage of students who fail reduced from forty nine percent to nine percent, and it has been consistent over for last three or four years. So, if that is what we can achieve through e learning or a blended approach, why shouldn't we try it? Because uh, actually, you suggested that you know if you can increase the throughput and mm -hmm. the retention of students will be. So, the, so that calls for an institutional wide sort of uh, research exactly, you want, exactly. to track the past to track the past over yeah. a few years yeah. and look at how yeah. this works. Yeah. I think as a stakeholder and academic who's not necessarily from a technology background, um, definitely one would want to know, so what exactly is e-learning? You've, you've mentioned that it's not just middle. So yeah. I think probably we would need some sort of training workshops, um, but obviously taking into account time. So obviously there's got to be this acknowledgement that one would be willing to go to a certain point, but of course I think support would be critical. So support for staff and mm. also the students of course because they are the receiving end essentially. Mm. So I think it's to, to take those aspects into account. Okay. For me I think um, part of what we need to reflect on is uh, what are the learning needs of our students? And, and couple that with their current exposure to technology. And not just exposure, but also interest in technology. And use that information to build strategy in how we can do this. And um, because that's, that's how we can hook um, our students and bring them on board and be excited about the space we're creating. Um, because if we don't do that, then we'll create a space where students are not excited about and then we lose them in the process. So I think if we can play that card in that way, then we may actually have so, the, so the idea is that while while there's a formal instruction going on at the university, mm. there should be some other kind of awareness and, and Indeed. other kind of churn within the university space yeah. about e-learning, about learning in general. Yeah. At the moment, our university, there is, there's no, there's no, there's nothing of that sort. There is no, uh, what a better word, an academic atmosphere. Yeah. If you, yeah. It's, it's like very much like a factory. Work, you know, we come in, we go to the office, we work, students come in, they go to work, which is the lectures, and they go home. Yeah. There's no, you know, if you go to university, and all of us have this experience where you get this academic feeling, you know, you get, um, maybe, maybe it's being too idealistic, but remember, we still retain our uh, character of being a contact you know, university. Yeah. And this requires those kind of spaces where yeah. learning space, we call them learning spaces, but we really don't, students go there to have their lunches, you know, and we need to start building. So you talk about that. And if we build yeah. that, listen, we're not going to reach all 42,000 students, but eventually we will reach more and more students. The yeah. point is, if we don't start it, it will never happen. Yeah. We've yeah. got to start. Yeah. Um, can we keep HR away from this? <laughs> <laughs> no, because if this becomes, if, if it goes to policy and then it becomes a thing and then HR gets involved, it's going to take all the 
enthusiasm and the heartbeat and the everything away from it. So if this becomes a policy that is policed by HR, it's going to, in my view, defeat the purpose because this is something to be enthusiastic about. I mean, it's something to, to be creative about. And as soon as HR get their fingers in it, all that disappears. Okay, and so whatever the policy is, I mean, that's why I, I love the idea of, of people who do this kind of have some insulation from the HR <laughs> policing. So that would be my thing. Don't, don't let HR get involved. Yeah, um, for me, it's just basically a mixture of what everyone else has said, to be honest. That's, it's, that's too easy. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that I feel like if 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 it's if, if it's conveyed to the academics as to the why, because I really feel that the why is it, it basically sets everyone into motion. If you don't understand why you're doing it, you're not you're never going to do it. So if 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 it, if we had the workshops like you said for the for the and we incorporated into into the. Um, this is the UEIP, the program for the new lecturers, the incoming academics, then it becomes easier. Everyone gets to the same level as, as they understand because there's, there's a new policy that says, this is, we, we're a blended, uni, blended learning university. Then it becomes easier to incorporate all the other stuff where each school will have that one person um, from the IT department who will be there to... From the Office of Technology. Yes, from the Office of Technology, yeah. yes. To help incorporate the ideas that the academics will have. And once they embrace it and make it their own, and sort of just, you know, everyone will be able to work together, including the students as well. But at, at the moment, it, 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 it'll, it'll be very hard because the, us as the academics don't understand why we have to do it. I want to just explore very quickly, though. I, I'm surprised. I mean, again, I haven't been part of the UIP process, but the fact that none of the emerging technologies, well, it seems to be if e-learning wasn't included no, it wasn't. in any of the discussions, what is the purpose? So what was the purpose of those? Yeah. There was one article on big data set and things. Yeah, it is yeah, implied, that's not the same. Not that's it not was supervision in higher education. Yeah. Yeah. It curriculum. was teaching curriculum assessment. design, teaching, teaching and learning, teaching, 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 teaching and, and assessment. assessment. Mm. But, but in teaching and learning and assessment, there should have been yeah. something. Yeah. But can I say that that's a, a generational problem. The people that were teaching on the course <laughs> are from a generation. <laughs> yeah. true that have no exposure to learning. Yeah. Which is problematic. Yeah. Yeah. And besides, the, the, the huge focus on that module was on policies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've just reflected on how that policy is void of that. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 it's a saturation on so should, policy should focus. A, I mean, uh, I'm not making a valued comment on the necessity for this program. The university has taken that decision. Mm. But should there be some kind of direction given to the program to incorporate emerging technologies. It has to. Definitely. Because the idea is to, you know, the point we made was, oh, we had this generational issue, but it's directed towards new lecturers. People are coming into the system. Now, we're going to bring new people into the system who are probably enthusiastic, hopefully, about the, the emerging technologies, and then we drive them through this Compulsory four modules and don't mention it exactly. anyway. Yeah. Not compulsory. Anyway. It's no longer to, compulsory. Not compulsory. Because they've run out of funding. Yeah. <laughs> it's not compulsory. So well. It's no longer compulsory. So it it was it had a funding thing for five four years, I yeah. think, and now it's not. Well, it's not voluntary. Yeah. yeah. But either way, and you have to it pay is, for it. it. And you've got to pay for it. Yeah. Are you going to pay for it? Yeah, because they've run out of funding. Because the UEIP is sort of running autonomously. And so they. So why pay. would people pay to go for it? No way. Because on performance management, it looks very good. Oh. <laughs> so if we're going to do something, but okay, let's let's leave that. Not a performance yeah. issue. But but do we agree that this course, if it is going to run with whatever form, should include yeah. aspects of? Yeah. It must be relevant. It does. It just must be relevant. It is there in the syllabus? Okay. But I, I I think they've just not had. Uh, someone so like uh, 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 Craig. Yeah. But why are they getting someone like Craig? Oh, well, that's, uh, that's, that's, another, issue. that's, that's, okay. that's another issue. HR. <laughs> no, actually, HR's got nothing to do with the list of line I think one of the motivations for the, the, the blended learning module that we were trying to organize with Prof was we we're going to motivate that it should be part of something like that UIP training. Mm. So it's an extra module that you have to do that gives you some of the hows on to you know do the whole blended approach so i think for me one of the things that out if i had an opportunity i would motivate for was that is 
not just talk about it, but here's a course that will at least give you a, a grounding on how to go forward. So, mm -hmm. I so think you incorporate this course into yes, the UIP? Yes, into the UIP. So I think that would be one. But in having said all of this, what happens over time is the idea of losing sight from the per from why we're actually doing this, and not from an intrinsic perspective, but from the student perspective. Because the whole point of this whole yeah. blended approach is, this whole e-learning is to meet a student in a better place, yeah. more familiar place to this millennial student so that you know learning can take place in a better way. So I think having said and done all of these things, it's important that we don't lose sight from the student and make it so formal, I, I don't know, for lack of a better word, that, you know, again, it alienates the student. Yeah. And really get the student's view of this. Is exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that I think that was, that was one. And I think the last thing that I would, this is the three, the last thing was also for more training for academics. Not just training the how, but it's more conversations around it because there's so much misinformation that is going on that some academics maybe feel oh, if we, I go this route, then where's my place, sort of. So to kind of like educate the academic that maybe, you know, your pedagogical approach is going to change and you become this different academic who is more of a facilitator and so on and so forth. So I think that can, that would be helpful, these three things. Okay. Yeah. May I, I only use one of them. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, as you said, that this whole notion of decolonization is sure. floating around and yeah. people are grappling with it academically and otherwise. Yeah. And I think that this is exactly the sort of decolonization you engage in the student. That's really yeah. the focus of what it should be. So I think that yeah, but at the moment, the students, you know, but the point I made, it's like coming to work, right? Yeah. There's this disjoint yeah. between students mm -hmm. and lectures. We, we're not we're not both going towards the same goal. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we, we're at the same place. Our job is to go to class and teach. But their job is to learn, yeah. maybe, or their job is to pass the exam, mm -hmm. which is not the same as learning. Yeah, okay. exactly. Their job is to pass the exam. Our job is to turn up to class. This is a much deeper issue than e-learning, mm -hmm. obviously, but 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 e-learning could be used to bridge right. that gap. I mean, technology could be used to. You know, we we complain that technology creates distance between people, like Facebook, etc., or WhatsApp, but it also can create bring people together who are not normally together. In, in communication forms, and, uh, and and that's something else that you know another facet that we need to. I've got a master student who was, who was investigating UKZN's Facebook page and how it's how it works. And this is resubmitting it more, but but it shows that our Facebook page is just used because we have to have one. Mm -hmm. There's no real, you know, research has shown that to to have an active Facebook page, you have to have at least six unique posts a day to keep the church to keep people interested. Mm -hmm. And you know we have one a week or one in two months or something. So that's another facet of it, you know, engaging with students mm -hmm. because students are there. We mm -hmm. need to be there as well. Mm -hmm. Instagram, for example, we have all these tick boxes mm -hmm. on our homepage, but nobody's well, churning. There's no churn on them. And this is that environment we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think to create this holistic environment for students. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm probably just repeating what has already been said, but it strikes me that. Uh, as a community, we don't have a coherent yes. um, uh, concept of e-learning, yeah. which is not a, a problem, it's not a deficit, it's just that we are all learning together. Sure. But certainly a guideline or a framework or a policy will help that, okay? Because even if a small group get together, they start um, developing a consciousness that will spread through the university. So we need that, that's important. But the other thing that also strikes me is that we, the average lecturer, average academic, doesn't know how to even do the basics. We all are using technology-enhanced learning to some extent, even if it means we're putting up a PowerPoint. Sure. But very often, our PowerPoints are simply um, text, ver uh, well, uh, they are visual versions of the text. Yeah. So we don't know how to make them interesting, mm -hmm. right? Or we don't know how to take a YouTube video and edit it so that just the succinct parts are what we want to show the students. We don't know how to do that unless we get a friend or we get my son to do it. You know? um, so we don't know the basics. So that problem can be easily addressed. Well, not easy because we need to have the people in, in place. 
are your instructional designers. Absolutely. Even if each college only had one, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that could take care of, of that kind of ongoing education. So, um, but the, the one feeds into the other, the policy and the need for the instructional de designers. Uh, has to be driven by the policy. That's got to be driven by the policy. However, going back to an initiative now, this is where I'm going to say, can't we go back to UTLO through the kind of offices of the Dean of Teaching and Learning? 100,000 rand was given to us through the university, but driven by our college, CLMS. And they were getting, it was, a, how long was the course? A, a year or six months? Yeah, I think six months. A six it's month course, three, three, three months. months. Okay. The first one? Yeah. 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 The only thing that was a stumbling block was we, did not, we didn't know how to pay them. <laughs> That's enough. Yes. Our university exactly. didn't know how to pay them. Uh, it was uh, 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 the mechanics of, of, of the actual banking transaction, and then people forgot about it. But that three-month course, which you could be made part of the performance management, whatever, was a, we saw the course, right? The yes, course uh, the, 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 was just a wonderful introduction to all academic stuff, and everyone could, could have um, participated. We paid 100,000 rand. You can get as many people on on board as we wanted and they would have gotten some kind of certificate i think yeah but the thing is uh, people like cecile and myself and those people who don't have a very coherent idea of e-learning would have benefited because the emphasis there wasn't just, send me some details yeah. 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 do you still have it on, on i think on? i still have i haven't checked oh, it and, and and so so okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, mine is just that if we are drawing up a policy or guideline or whatever it might be, there should be some flexibility in there um, for academics to experiment with what yeah. they feel, yeah. um, obviously around the guidelines, uh, especially with um, me being passionate about the assessment side of it, you're kind of like restricted in what you can do because there isn't a policy in place at the moment. So I could take the online assessments up to um, tests, but I couldn't do it in exams because the university exams exactly. policy didn't allow it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so there needs to be a holistic re-looking at all our teaching and learning policies in light of uh, technology. Yeah. So and we're not doing that. experiment with something and they feel it can be taken a step forward, support from you know, management or wherever your academic leader would help to push it mm -hmm. so that you can get it through the system. Otherwise, it stays where it is. And then you have students saying, we're doing it online for tests, but in exams, you still got to go and teach and how this yeah. is. So it's a totally different issue. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, that's an important point. Yeah. The other, other aspect, um, and I know Prof. will try to do this and Prof. Ricardo, is just having little sessions where you're sharing best practices and I know Craig's doing it now. But if something's worked for you, um, you know, share it with other people so that we can all learn from each other because it's something that I don't know, especially in the technology side. This links to what Craig was saying about this group of people mm -hmm. who get involved with it. Yes, I, yes that's, uh, and uh, you know, even this forum here. We probably all learned a little bit from each other yeah, and from, because we don't normally get together to do this. Yeah. I mean, at this evaluation I was involved in, when the staff got together, this is the first time they got together. They said they didn't know this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mentioned Book Boom, for example, and, and using Book Boom for teaching of English, uh, writing, you know, foreign language English speakers and how to, how to write a thesis. All of these. What surprised me, and maybe because where we come from, we, we, we have all these access to the, we know about it. But there isn't, these are colleagues of ours at the university who I thought should know about this because it's free, it's quality textbooks. And not only that, there are a whole lot of other free resources on there. They didn't know a thing about it. And not, they're not bad academics. I'm not suggesting that at all. But there's just no repository of knowledge where, or, or process where we could share this, for example, and say, hey, you know, have you looked at Book Boom for, for free ebooks for your class? Or have you looked at Connections? Or have you looked at this for books, etc.? cetera? Yeah. Um Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm advertising for a different thing. Um, but we have launched or are about to launch from the UTLO office a virtual mentoring community. Uh, some of you might have got emails. Mm. And that's going to be, well, <laughs> the, it's envisaged to be a kind of repository because they're the four things where people can say, hey, I and under teaching and learning, I just tried this and it it was terrible okay. it was great so so there is and that's coming from the utello off, mm. um, office so it is yeah i'm sure there's lots of so, so you know and it's and it's 
but I mean, it's it's going to take time, as you say, to to get people buying into it. But we, they are creating spaces for these kinds of yeah. communities. But, but it has to be communicated yeah. broadly. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, colleagues. I think I think we've run out of time. Kriyap has given me dirty looks from there. <laughs> but uh, thank you very very much for your time. I hope you we all appreciated this. Thing. Have you all given Kriyap your VX numbers uh, so that we can transfer some funds into your research accounts? So I know it's we're not paying you for this. But it's just appreciation for, for I've asked for funding for this, so you can fund your next half uh, so ticket. So what is it, 100,000 100, <laughs> rand? <laughs> you fly we can, first we class, can yes. Fund our, we can fund our, in our new offices of technology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 you can donate them right back. You can yeah. donate them. But listen, well, I've also provided lunch, so oh, you must have lunch. Otherwise, it will be a fruitful, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, as Bumpin says. So, so I, and I think they want to use this tool for something else before we, we can adjust. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. You. Thank you. So maybe just a quick thing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. been very valuable. Yeah. I think we've moved moved forward. Yeah. Yeah. What else do we ask? I will feed back to this group after the, the student session and after the. I think we want to. Sort of, we have to write a document, and I'll share the document. With you. No, I don't. You're going to fill in that.